Epochs, Stormborn Saga Book 7, written by J.T. Williams, copyright 2019, part 1, Visions. Valrin shivered in the icy crosswinds. Fog rolled over the deck of the Aela Sunrise, veiling his vision as Bry and Evern cast their wards in an overlapping shield. The captain would not back down from this fight. Spells burst atop them. Their enemy was as determined as they were. The massive bronze and wood vessel was within only a ship's breadth from the front of the Aela Sunrise. Valrin kept his heading, turning slightly and sending a wall of water pushing up against the opposing ship. The Aela Sunrise was powerful, but this ship's deck towered over them. You're too close! You're going to strike! Ordak shouted. He held fast, adjusting the levers at the helm and sending the crystals spinning along the deck. Energy was building. It had been some time since he'd faced off another vessel, but the dwarven pirates were nothing like this. The fogs around them split, and a winged form struck them. The entire front of the Aela Sunrise was pushed under the ocean. He shifted his track, spinning the wheel to the right to disengage. The winged form shot upward, and blasts of magic tracked after it. Fogs rolled over them from a different way. The fogs did not look the same. Valrin switched weapons, sending energy into the mass to blast fire at the other vessel. He hoped the Verret gamblers had gotten far out of range of it by now, and the fogs had blinded the vessel enough to where it kept its attention on them. He just needed to disable the other ship. That was it. Suddenly he saw the image of a masked form, blackness, and then nothing. The deck of the Aela Sunrise was still. Valrin could see nothing save a white fog surrounding his vessel and his companions, frozen in time. They did not even seem alive. Somehow, though, he was able to walk around. He looked over the edge of the railings and saw that the water was still. You are the Stormborn of the North. You have a path. You now take another one, one you must see to completion. Perhaps it is a terrible fate to meddle in the affairs beyond your calling. Only time will show you the truth. The voice was sudden, and in a burst of white, everything returned to as it was. But it wasn't the same. Nothing was the same. Valrin looked up at orange skies and a large island covered in green. Ordak jumped around in place. What happened? What happened? Valrin, why are you not at the helm? Bry looked around. Where are we? The ship. It was just there. The fogs. Even lowered his staff and stared at Valrin. Did you activate something on the ship? I know you've been studying the texts of the shipbuilders for some time now. No, nothing. I saw fog and then all was still. A voice spoke. The voice called me Stormborn. It said I was taking another path, one I must see to completion. Time will show me the truth. The clockmaster? Ordak questioned. Clock and time make sense to me. The question I have is where are we now? Evern asked. This place does not look like any place I have seen, especially in the north. The island before them was dark but green. The orange sky came from a low-hanging sun just above the horizon, but the waters itself looked red in the hue of light. A single blue glow was on the island ahead. Valrin flipped up the map they had used for navigation, but nothing showed up. Are we in a different realm? Bry asked, like when we went to Urlas? Perhaps, but that took deliberate action on our end. Something or perhaps someone has directed us here. Well, Captain? We'll go ashore, Valrin said. The place where the light is coming from is a good enough beacon as any. Or like a lighthouse telling us that rocks are ahead, Ordak said. Valrin directed the Aela Sunrise toward the beach and found an actual dock of stone, not too dissimilar to other Dwemhar docks, but the ship did not get taken into the grasp of the structure. Bry and Ordak jumped off to secure the vessel to the docks. What do you think? Valrin asked Evern. Evern looked around and they both looked at the dense jungle before them. It looks quiet, no monsters especially. No damn monsters. The jungle reminds me of the south, but the sun has not moved position at all, 
and does not seem to be doing so. He looked up. No stars, nothing but darker orange. I think we're in a different realm. Valrin ensured his sword was at his hip. Hopefully we won't need that, Evern said. Well, I've had it nice for the past few days. I'd say it's about time I get my hands dirty in the fight again. The vessel seemed to be unable to damage that other one, Ordak said. Surprising. It always is with us, Bry said. They disembarked. Avern's staff was their only real light as they began into the jungle and followed a break in the trees to an actual stone road, where they were surprised to see torches that seemed to lead them along a long and barren pathway. Are we expected? Ordak asked. I swear this better not be one of those gods, Evorn said. Oh? Bry asked. You can never trust gods even though Etha has helped us out a lot of late. She'll want payment or sacrifice, Ordak said. She doesn't take sacrifices, Bry said. Studying religion, Rusis? Evern asked. A bit. I had nothing better to do back in Taria. So, scholar, what do you suggest we do now? Keep down the path? Bry laughed. I was studying religion, not geography. I have no idea where this leads us. Valrin noticed that the road was climbing upward, and it was here they came to a large bridge made of wood and stone. He looked over the edge of the bridge and saw nothing but blackness on either side of the bridge, which reached far across the chasm to an elevated landmass seemingly floating in the middle of the air. Valrin led them across the chasm. The bridge swayed ever so slightly as they began the climb up the precarious passageway. He kept his hands on the rope railings, but with each step he could feel the movement of the rest of the crew in the palms of his hands, the ropes moving with each step. He looked out, seeing the sea to his left and the dark jungles to his right. The air wasn't cold, yet wasn't warm. It was like there was no temperature at all. He looked back behind them. The Ayla sunrise was visible, sitting at dock far below them, and Bry made a movement with her eyes. Get going. I don't like being up here. He turned around and quickly made his way to the upper portion of the bridge, coming to the last bit that took a sharp incline to a stone platform where a torch basin glowed brightly. He noticed that here the jungle spread out around a large, open, grassy plain that surrounded a stone wall that seemed to be more aesthetic than anything, as it was not high enough to prevent one from climbing it. As the rest of the crew made it up, Ordak sniffed the air. Smells like nothing. Like, I suspect it should smell of something, but nothing. It really smells like nothing. I swear this is a different realm, Evern said. Or time? Bry asked. Time? Valrin questioned. The Ayla Sunrise has no such power. It wasn't the Ayla Sunrise that did this. You said that yourself. Evern pointed forward with his staff. There is a gateway in the wall. We should proceed. Valrin kept his hand on his blade as he guided the rest of them to the wall and the gateway flanked by large figures holding orbs above their heads. Intricate patterns in the rock were reminiscent of Dwemar structures, but dissimilarly they had no light to them. The gates were open and, though ornate, did not reveal any further information to their origin. As they followed a dark tunnel, they came to a courtyard overgrown with grass, but with many large pools that mirrored the orange sky above them. To their right were several trees that were flowering white petals that, though there was no wind, lifted into the sky and followed a line of torches back up to the left. To their left they saw a massive stairwell that led up to a doorway that was open but dark beyond the void of the entryway. They proceeded, ascending the stairs and noticing that, from there, they could see much more of the jungle around them. Avern pushed ahead of Valrin and looked within the temple. I have never seen a structure such as this, though it reminds me slightly of temples we have in the Shadowlands. Minus the floating flowers without wind, Ordak said. Evorn nodded. Valrin and Evern walked in together as everyone else followed slowly behind. The interior of the temple structure was dark and surprisingly quite humid. They could hear water falling almost as if a waterfall were nearby. 
but in the darkness they could not see. Evan used his staff to create life, and as he did, the entire temple seemed to produce a whistling sound and then began to glow blue. In front of them, a glowing orb of dazzling white appeared floating on an elevated platform. Stormborn of the glacial seas, a voice said, and crew of the realm ship Aela Sunrise, welcome. Welcome to what is, what isn't, and what still remains. Valrin paused. Where are we? A few more moments, and you'd have been dead. I called out, used what ability I had, and pulled you to this place. Not quite the answer to his question, Ordak said. The orb shifted to that of a glowing old man. No, it isn't. But it is still true. You are Ordak, the half-orc, Evern, Shadow Elf, and Bry, Rusis. I knew the gods spoke your names. Ether worked to guide the ranger and the rogue as all seek redemption. Then you know Fadis and Kirla are not with us. Do you know if they are safe? Valrin asked. I am no god, Captain. No, far from it. But I have my workings in the world. I have been many things and have hid in many places. Even now this form before you is but one form. A half-god, Ordak said. Or demigod. No, I am just a man of science and mechanics. Some would say a master of time. The clockmaster, Evern said. The one Marag is working with. Evern's staff rippled with energy, but the man just stared. I do not work with that entity, but I will not explain such things as of yet. Urugui has fallen. That is good. He and his rings trapped many for Marag, and in such... They moved into hidden places and captured that which was lost to the world. Iclo, the ancient city, has been awakened. The Scourge Siren yet exists in spirit alone. Iclo has spoken after her long sleep. Once again, another is formed into the evil that is the Scourge Siren. That is Avium, Valrin said, stepping forward. A member of my crew and a friend. The figure landed before Valrin, and Evern, as well as Bry, quickly moved forward to stand beside him. I mean none of you harm, the man said. I am he who you claim, the clockmaster. I have made many demons and friends alike. I was once quite well regarded within the world, but my name became a cursed one. Marag is but a fiend I have not defeated, but I offer hope. The new scourge, this one you call Avium, she is yet not fully formed. Think of Iclo as a giver of life, while for many eras it created massive creatures to soar the skies and swim the oceans, and was a place for creating life within the world, all creatures within it have been released. The rudimentary calculations used to ensure its life-sustaining force is enough have focused into one form, your friend. Like a mother chicken sitting upon eggs, your friend grows into the power bestowed upon her. A yeklo is like an incubator. The key will be stopping the process upon her, silencing the gears that turn within the ancient city. How do we turn it off? How do we take its magic? Ordak asked. A direct way is not available, though I do think there is a way. I did not call you to this place to converse this way for no reason. I have already placed an enchantment upon the deck of your ship. In the simplest of words, it is a device. You must sail east, away from this island. Activate the device, and you'll be upon your world again, and then continue heading east. There, you'll find a tower. When you are before that tower, activate the device again. Proceed as you will see your path. Look for a blue structure. I assure you, you cannot miss it if coming from the sea. How can we trust what you're saying? Bry asked. I have been asked that before. Know me as the clockmaster, and know that not all know that others have worked in my image for nefarious purposes. I attempt to right what I allow to be led astray. You are the guardian of the seas, Valrin, he said, now staring at Valrin alone. The gods of the north know my purpose and trust this task to you and your crew. The man shifted back to that of an orb, and in a flash the temple was dark. Valrin turned to the others, and suddenly they were back aboard the Aela Sunrise and adrift. 
What? Ordak asked. Valrin went to the helm, shifting the vessel to the right. East? Bri asked. Well, before we ended up here, we were headed north. I can't tell which way we're oriented right now, and the maps do not function. We'll head this way and see what happens. Avern went to the rear of the ship, where the many crystals that powered it seemed to all elevate for a moment. There was a silver device with gears and cogs. A center portion of it was made of pure crystal. Captain, it seems he did put... something... on the ship. Ordak snorted. Did anyone else see what happened? Did you not see that we were in a temple and now we're here? It happens, Bry said. Lots of strange things happen to us. Evorn laughed. It is okay, my friend. In time, you'll get used to such happenings. Ordak shook his head and looked up at the sky. What about that? They looked up to see the sky was becoming dark. Activate the device, Valrin ordered. Avern did so, and they were upon the glacial seas once again. The sudden frigid cold was stark, but not too unexpected. They were no longer near Iclo, and wherever they were, it did not look familiar considering there was nothing around them. Valrin attempted to bring up the map once again. This time, the image of the glacial seas appeared. Where are we? Evern asked. East, far east. There is ocean around us, but it seems that there is nothing showing up. I do not even see that we are upon ocean, yet we are. Are those mountains on the map? While normally the map of the Aela Sunrise would show the actual ocean and clouds as one would expect as if flying high above them, this time they looked as what a bird would see upon land. We are most definitely upon the ocean, Ordak said. Then where do we go? Bry asked. East, until a tower. Perhaps this will all make sense in time. Their journey continued without any trouble. Bry showed Ordak where their stores were and made some tea for each of them. Evorn poured over the guides to the Aela Sunrise, but could not find anything referencing the Clockmaster. At this moment, Valrin realized he had not slept in some time. You're just now realizing that? I expected you to sleep in Sailmark. You were lying down, Bry said. Yes, but I could not rest. I closed my eyes, thought of the ocean, but no real sleep. No sleep? Ordak asked. He only sleeps when the ship is at dock, and I guess, Evern said, closing the book he was reading, when he feels safe. I can only imagine that it was because the ship's energy was restored at Sailmark that you were restored as well. The power of the Stormborn, Bry said. Ordak laughed, chugging the hot tea. Weird friends, Evern. Valrin laughed. We are a bit strange. The sun had fallen from the point it was when they'd first emerged upon the glacial seas again, and now a near-dark sky was before them. The stars were shining already, and in the distance they could see a lonely mountain, a lone peak surrounded by water. Valrin looked at the map, and it seemed they were upon a lake with a circle of mountains around it, the largest of the mountains directly in front of them, but he saw no other mountains. This is odd, Bry said. Well, the old world was flooded, Valrin said, but the maps of the ship do not seem to know this region, or perhaps they were older. I really do not know. They came to the shadow of the mountain as the moon rose in the far east. In the darkness of the mountain, they could see a skeleton of a structure. The tower, Valrin said. The clockmaster was correct. Then I'll activate the device, Evern said. He knew much of us. Let us hope we truly are on the path we are to take. Valrin nodded. Evorn exhaled and pushed the crystal. The world around them fell away, and this time they saw the image of the sun and the moon but for a much longer period. After several cycles, the Aela sunrise tossed in the water before them, and Valrin was forced against the helm of the ship. The others were thrown about, but as the ship steadied in the waters, Valrin looked to the waters beside them and could see pristine, clear waters and white stones in the depths below. 
He looked around them, seeing a crown of green mountains, and unlike the place before, he could smell sweet herbs in the air. The mountain before them seemed to have grown substantially in size. The tower, only a fragment before, was now a white and silver helm that rose high upon the mountain. Beneath it, wrapping up the mountain itself, were silver walls and glowing crystals that glimmered in the sunlight. Where are we? Bry asked. Evorn stood with mouth agape. Surely not. What? This place? This is... the past. What? Orda questioned. This is... This is exactly as writings I have come across. This is a true Dwemhar city. We have gone into the past. Part 2. Clocks. Valrin did not know what to think of what was before him. There were other ships, almost like his own, but without the crystals his had. Shift the ship to mimic the others, Evan said. Do as you do to make it like a simple vessel. Perhaps that power will mimic these. We do not need to stand out. Stand out, Ordak said. I'm a half-orc. Bry tossed Ordak a cloak. Hide yourself, then. If these are Dwemhar, we cannot hide, Valrin said. A VM could see into our minds, and she is only half. The clockmaster must have known this, Bry said. He would not have sent us somewhere we could not be successful. He has told the truth so far. It's been less than a day, Evern said, but we must be mindful of our thoughts. There are many strange vessels here. The map shows this is a lake, but perhaps there are peoples of other races to whom we will not seem so odd. They came to the dock, and while there was a figure noting the ship's arrival, he did not speak to them. Valrin noticed the Ayla sunrise locked into place just as before at the other Dwemhar docks, but nothing else happened. Valrin and the others disembarked, but as they looked back to the Ayla sunrise, they noticed that aside from it looking like the other vessels, it seemed to have its own crew. In fact, no one noticed them at all. Though they walked around them as if there were someone there, they did not seem to actually see them. Come, Evern said. They proceeded in a single file line, walking past several figures busy loading boxes onto another ship, and at least two fishers sitting on rocks beside the docks. Valrin noticed that these people all seemed to be wearing white robes with gold sashes. Several also had head garments with jewels across their foreheads. They came up to the gateway and to two figures who seemed to be guards of some kind. They each had swords with jeweled hilts at their hips, but their eyes were covered. Instead, they had an emblem of an eye on their chests. Valrin could feel them looking at him, though he didn't look at them. They passed unhindered through the gates. The city was vibrant with life and many herbs and flowers growing everywhere. Beside the nearest road ran a canal with the purest of streams and no sign of algae or grime along the water's edge. Center posts ran on either side of the roads with small crystals suspended above the posts, but other than that, there were no other crystals. Looking far ahead, they saw that the road reached upward above the city and into the high mountains. It was here the road connected to the tower that rose off the mountains. A blue structure, Bry said, pointing. The clockmaster had told them to look for a blue structure, and indeed they found one, but it was small and just out of sight. In fact, he was surprised Bry had seen it tucked beside a larger building that seemed to be some type of workshop. Let's go, Valrin said. He led them further in, noticing that there were several of the guards like the ones from the gate staring at them from afar. Evern tapped his staff and Rossi emerged from his robes. Go see what you can find, he told the snake. Rossi slithered off and vanished. Valrin led them to the blue house, and they knocked and then waited. Nothing. They knocked again, and then Ordak slammed his fist in a rather boisterous knock. Ordak, that's a bit much, Bry said. Maybe they're sleeping. He smiled. They could hear someone on the other side, and then the sounds of several latches and locks. The door opened, 
and a man stared at them, but the man had a strange device on his head and many lenses that stacked in a long cone in front of one of his eyes. He flipped the lenses up. Oh dear, no, no, no. He slammed the door closed. Valrin was about to knock again when it opened back up. The man looked as if he had seen a ghost, his eyes wide and his face white. Oh, get in, get in, he commanded. We come from far, Ordak began. Shut up, you oaf. Get in. I know what this is. Valrin and the others entered the residence and immediately were forced up a flight of stairs, pushed away from the room on the lower level. The man followed them after locking back the front door, closing another door on the second level. Valrin looked around the room they had been forced into and saw a plethora of drawings and broken metal objects. A floating crystal that was split apart hovered in the room. A massive window on one side of the room gave sight of the lake where they had arrived, but this too was covered as the man hit a switch and a covering dropped over the window. The man sat down in a chair and began to rock back and forth. Great, just great. I knew this would happen. You knew what? Valrin asked. You, you're not from here. You look like you're from here, but I can see more. I can see the dust on your shoulders. You've come through time. I've done it once or ten times, but you've done it, and you're here. Why would I do this? Do what? Evan asked. Oh, I always mess this stuff up in the future. Always? How many times have you done this? I don't know. I don't know, but if you're here, I messed something up. I did. I did. I didn't. I didn't. The man began screaming, and Evern smacked him with his staff. We followed the clockmaster's wishes. We went east, found a tower, and activated the device placed on our ship, and were here. Ship? The flying ones or the sailing ones? The sailing, Valrin said. So, the realm ships work, and the flying vessels with crystals in their center? I have seen drawings from a long time ago, Evern said but there are no more in our time. Where are we? Where are the Dwemar? They ascended from the living realm, Valrin said. Ascended? Truly? We were successful. So why? Why are you here? We don't know, Valrin said. Our friend is trapped upon Ayaklo. She is being turned into something beyond herself. A great evil, Evorn said. Ayaklo? What is this Ayaklo? An ancient Dwemhar city, Evorn said. You do not know of it? It floats above the ocean, or so the story said. Levitation! It works? How? We don't know, Ordak shouted. What kind of monstrosity are you? Not of the pure races. Ordak drew his blade, and Bri put her hand up, sparking fire. Rusis! the man shouted. He ran for the door, pulling open the latches, when Evern and Ordak both grabbed him. She's going to kill me! She's going to kill me! No, she isn't, Valrin said firmly. You need to help us. We were told to come here. Go to a blue house. Where we come from, Iclo has awakened. We came to you for help, and now you must help us. The man was breathing fast, but worked to slow his own breathing. Okay, okay, it's just... You're from the future. You got sent to the past, which means I was successful. The Dwemhar ascended, but I did not, which is confusing, but anyway. I don't know. I don't know, he repeated. What can I do to help you? We need to put out the city of Ayeklo. We need to shut it down. You need a dispel of some kind. The man stood up, jumping for a small pearl on a nearby desk. He picked up a magnifying glass and opened the covering on the window, allowing a small bit of light into the room. He then focused the light through the magnifying glass into a beam that he placed on the pearl. From the pearl, the light bent around the substance and hit the crystal hovering in the room. I use this to deactivate the crystal, and... He held it steady for a few moments, and the crystal slowly fell to the ground and rested on its side, it works just fine. That is a small crystal and a small pearl, Ordak said. Is this truly why you were sent here? 
I do hope this knowledge helps, for I am Elio, scientist of the Dwemhar. My work is but small to them. They concentrate on their mind powers, but to truly grow great, we will need the power of crystals. And you all, he said with a smile, confirm I was finally successful. That's great, Evan said. Now, simply provide us where we can obtain the device as you have here, and we'll be on our way. Eliu stared at Evern. So simply you jump between time? Perhaps I was able to develop part of my machine? Does it open realms? No, Valrin said, but the magic exists. Not magic, Eliu said, just science. But Evern, you asked a question, and I have an answer. I can get you what you need but we'll need to go on a bit of a journey away from the city, aboard your ship, he pointed to Valrin. I have a way to the port, for I'm a very popular man here, and I do not wish to be seen. Yes, there is a place, a holy place, but a place I can get us to. It is where I found this pearl. It is where we go now. This strange man did not inquire of their names, but they each took time to tell him as he buzzed around the room, grabbing random gadgets and packing a small bag. Yes, yes, that is all good. We need to know each other, but be mindful. We cannot kill anyone or it would throw the world asunder or just might mean very horrible actions in your own world. So, no magic, no stabbing people. Just run, quickly. The man opened a doorway that led to nothing but a stone wall. Um, Bry said. That's a wall. Oh, come on! Eliu was the first to run headfirst into it and vanished. A portal, Evern said. Fine, let's go. Ordak? Why am I always first when you don't know what's on the other side? Ordak ran ahead and vanished. Because, dear orc, Evern said to Valrin and Brye, and he's covered in tougher skin than me. Evern pulled Valrin and Bry in with him at the same time. Valrin felt himself get squeezed, and then the air become thick. They were in a cave looking out to the lake. Valrin! Ordak motioned. Look! Several of the Dwemhar guards were standing near his ship. Wonderful, Evern said. They've noticed what should be. We can fight them, Ordak said. No, 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 you cannot! We must be good little time guests. You and you, Eliu said, pointing to Valrin and Bry. You two go. You can blend in, unlike the Shadow Elf and the Orc. Get the ship and come pick us up. Valrin and Bry looked at one another. Our garb is not exactly the same as everyone else's, Bry said. But your faces are fine, and you do not have the memories the other two here have, he said, motioning to the others. I can sense the dark things you have both seen, and done. The guards will pick up on that. The other two are much younger, and, well, it seems their memories are not so horrible. I thought we blended in, Ordak asked. Well, well, maybe, but we can't take chances. Come on, Valrin said. Valrin, be careful, Evern said. Never, he said with a chuckle. As he and Bry emerged from the cave, they noticed they were some distance around the shore of the lake and had to walk around to the actual docks. While there were several guards, they did not pay attention to them. The sirens advanced into the city twice, one of them said. We must speak with the elders, another said. It was the Ruses who went to the shrine of Meridas first. They likely convinced them of something we do not have. But the crash... The vessel killed one of their princes who was swimming just beneath the surface. Eliu is missing, and without him, we cannot perfect this science. He has cut himself off from the conclave. He has betrayed us. Valrin and Brae moved quickly past the guards and to the deck of the Aela Sunrise. Sir, one of the guards said. Yes, Valrin responded. Your ship is not one that has been here before. Just stopping in for some spices, some deliveries. The Dwemhar stood tall. He closed his eyes, and the center of his forehead began to glow. 
A blast of magic exploded over the top of the docks, and Valrin looked over to the cave. Evern's staff was alight. Immediately, several Dwemhar swarmed the area. Valrin took that moment to shift the switches of the Aela Sunrise, moving away from the dock with haste. A blast of white struck the ship, but the Aela Sunrise kept moving away. Evern was out of the cave. He sent a blast of earth magic into the ground, sending several pillars up around them to cover them as more blasts struck near the cave. Valrin brought the vessel up toward the cave and let down the walkway for them to board. They quickly did so, even as several vessels pushed forward in pursuit. Valrin increased their speed, raising the sails and making a circle in the lake. Where do we go? he shouted to Eliu. Head for the towers! he pointed. Valrin noticed two glowing towers at the edge of the lake. Those will not attack us, Ordak said. Attack? Whatever do you mean? Those are only portals to the lower lakes. We need to get through before they sound the warning. Warning? Bry asked. A large shrieking horn call went out, and the winds shifted around them. A moment later, several Dwemhar vessels sent volleys into the air. Valrin shifted his own weapons, sending bolts of blue streaking across the lake, striking the incoming bolts of glowing magic. Magnificent, Eliu said. So the crystals can be used as weapons. Another ship was approaching their side, attempting to get in front of them. The Dwemhar aboard it had staves and sent blasts of magic screaming across the deck in dazzling sparks of white. Evern cast his own ward and deflected several more blasts. Valrin activated the center masts, sending a blast of fire, striking the other ship's sails and disabling it. Eliu was in awe. The shrieking horn call went out again, and the space between the two hours began to close, but not soon enough. The Ayla sunrise passed through the void, and it seemed they were going off a cliff, but instead they struck the ocean far below. An ocean? Here? I thought this was all land in this region? Evern asked. An inner land ocean, the most magnificent of places and connected to the great oceans around the vast lands by a silver passageway, the most beautiful of canals where I have only been once, but can tell you that there you behold the true beauties of the oceans and seas. But we go somewhere else. Valorin looked behind him. They are not pursuing. They do not know where we go, Eliu said, his hand holding a silver object with a crystal in its center. And that is, Evern asked, my key to hide my tracks. Speaking of hiding, the guards spoke of you, Valrin said. Eliu sighed, and they said? That you betrayed the Dwemhar, that a vessel of your people crashed and killed a prince related to Meridas or Sirens or something. They test the flying vessels, Eliu said. He sighed again and shook his head. The war with the Ruses will be horrible. So, the war has begun? Evern asked. Not yet. I have danced around time a bit and know it comes. They wish to take what I created and, for the greater good of the Conclave, to use these ships as needed. Like my ship? Valrin asked. No, not this. This was by the split off, the Sea Peoples, no doubt something I will have dealings with, but I do not know for sure. Ask me in a few thousand years. He laughed, but no one else did. No, these vessels are the ones that have a crystal within them and fly with the sound of melody. As Evern said, they exist, but I do not see how. I have blocked my mind from the others. They'll have to capture me, and I have no intent of that. I will help you. I must have my reasons for sending you here to find me. Well, that is a confusing sentence. But indeed, now, I must direct you to my island. Eliu took out a strange device and held it at an angle that caught the sunlight above them. The top of it began to glow, and as he moved to place it on the railings before Valrin, it dimmed and then grew brighter. Now keep this lit and, he said, rushing to the front of the ship. It was here he pulled out another small device. 
He pressed it into the wood and clamped it to the railings. All right, Captain, bring us to the left. Falrin shifted the wheel, and the device in front of him began to glow brighter. There was a flash on the front of the vessel, and the second device lit up. There you have it! Keep this heading! As Elayu returned, Bry looked at his devices and shrugged. Could you not just adjust the maps on the Ayla Sunrise? Maps? Valrin twisted the crystal and brought up the imagery of the map. For a few moments, they could see the glacial seas and many islands. But then, nothing. The map went blank. Well, that's a wonderful example, Evan said. This is why parchment works better for a map. Ordak laughed. The water, all the water, Elihu said. That is why you were surprised by this water. That is the future. Don't you know of the future? You sent us back here, Bry said. The future, the past, the careful balance of going where you do not exist yet. No, of the future, I know little. Though by default, I learn some things much easier because of my future self. I believe that is only because I went further back in time, before now in the future. But my older self likely prevents me from gaining certain knowledge. Perhaps during this time, I shall do or change something in his time. Therefore, we must be careful. How far in the past are we? Evern asked. I know no measurement that will make sense for you. I can say that we are well yet before the time of the Dwemhar and Rusi's wars. I can say that the Dwemhar do not have the technology you would expect. They still hold true to their meditative powers and the use of flowing energy. The gods still walk among us at times, but it is rare. Ether, however, comes often. Something perhaps forgotten of in your time. Evern laughed. No, Ether still comes upon the land, quite often. That will likely be her downfall. I know some of the gods die in the future. But for now, this world holds in a balance. These lands are yet a utopia of life. The inner sea we travel upon has many villages, and there is no war here, not yet. Valrin noticed that the device on the front of the ship was beginning to dim, so he adjusted his heading to where it was alight again. So you wish to prevent your research from being used by the Conclave? Evern asked. Nothing good will come of it. I wish to create vessels that float through the skies, to be closer to the gods, to work to watch over the race of men, as we were charged with, as were the elves, dwarves, and rusis, but it is like our world can do nothing but bicker at one another. The influence of the Itsu is strong. The Rusis seek our knowledge, and though there have been alliances before, they have only lasted a time. Alliances? As in war? We have worked with the Rusis to thwart threats to our lands from the Shadow Realm, a place that blends with our world at times, especially when many have created meditative energy. This energy is created in the mind, he said, pointing at his forehead. Those of the shadows feed on such energy, but I am protected from such things. A device? Valrin asked. Ha! Huh, no, I use my powers to invent new things, thus using my mental energy to manipulate the physical world. It tires me substantially, and though I use meditation to calm my mind, I cannot access the higher level powers of my people. Some of the Conclave meditate for many cycles of the sun. Their powers are beyond most of this world. Yet, they need you to make their flying machines work? Ordok teased. Yes, but then they can do more than I will ever be able to do without machines and constructs. I know evil comes to this world. I only hope that I can have a hand in protecting our people and our realm. Valrin had noticed a speck of land in the far distance some time ago. Now coming closer to a very small island, Elihu went to the railings on the right side of the ship. He pulled out a small silver staff from his robes and lifted his other hand. Slow, Captain. We only need to get close enough. His staff began to shimmer white, and he lifted it higher. Valrin looked over to their left, 
and could spot the thin outline of a massive tower rising out of the ocean. The winds shifted around them, and it was then he felt the warmness of the air, a strange feeling considering he knew how far north they were. Bry gripped his hand, and he looked down to her. I never thought I'd ever be in a place like this, in a different time. She smiled. He did not have words to respond, but he was happy that for a moment they had a sense of peace. The world around them, compared to that of Taria and Ayeklo, was completely different, a world without the pain to come, when the great races were still in power before the flooding of the North and the South. The ship suddenly shook. Ah, yes, 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 it will work with this ship. Two silver rods emerged on either side of the Ayla sunrise. What is this? Avern asked. Well, Elihu responded, skipping up to the helm. First, good captain, proceed to that tower you see in the distance, and I'll explain on the way. Valrin proceeded in the way Elihu directed, and as the ship began to move, the two rods started to hum. That's an ominous sound, Bry said. They are charging. We use wind in most applications of energy use as of right now. But I do believe that even though your ship uses crystal systems, it should work well. They integrated with the inner portion of the ship. So that means? Valrin questioned. It means that they could become part of your vessel, but I will no doubt need them again, so I will remove them once we are done. Evern sighed. Going back to what I asked before, what are they? Oh, yes. The man laughed. They are our key into the underwater city, a place of the mayor and the great god Meridas. It is here we will proceed to the temple and retrieve what we need. Steel. He means steel, Ordak stated. Yes, we all know what he means, Evern said. Underwater, I see the tower ahead. Elio nodded. Yes, but we cannot pass over their sacred waters in any vessel. Such a happening would be a great insult. We must pass through the lower portion of the city. You are aware, Dwemhar, that we cannot breathe water? Bry asked. Yes, I am aware you cannot pull that substance from the water that contains what you need to breathe. There isn't air in water, Ordak said. No, your bodies just do not have what they need to pull the air from the water. You would need gills. Valrin noticed that though Elihu was a particular type of character who seemed insane and crazed, the man had a deeper knowledge. It was also evident that this younger version of the clockmaster had much hidden from him by his older self. Though the temple they were approaching was of a magnificent and grand design, Valrin looked off in the distance and spotted floating landmasses above the water and clouds that looked as mountains high above them. Circling around the inner ocean of the lands were larger mountains, the peaks of which would one day be the islands of the glacial seas. He paused, thinking of the horror of the walls of water coming through this place during the floods. It was difficult to think of such things, to think of what would come of these lands. They were in the far past, and he understood why they had to be careful. Too much of a change to the balance of the world, and they would change the future. Wherever they went next, they had to be careful to not end up in a fight like they did in the Dwemhar city. Okay, we're nearly there. We're nearly to the holy oceans of Meridas, Elihu said. Valrin thought they were still far away, but along the water he noticed there were flat rocks and golden fences with statues of different sea creatures with humanoid characteristics of arms and legs. What are these strange animals? Ordak asked. Those who revere Meridas believe that water is the hand of the great poet, that he created all of the world, and thus even those who cannot breathe in the depths are still creations of the god. Though we know this to not be true, sirens and mermaids still claim this. I'd rather not argue with them, especially the sirens. Causing division in a culture just because we know a supposed truth does not make much sense. They can believe as they wish. They are not harming those of the Dwemhar. Eliu went to the device he had added to the ship and moved his fingers along several runic keys. Suddenly the two metal objects grew in length 
and met at the top of the mast of the ship. The vessel was forced downward, water spilling over the front of the ship. The Ayla sunrise was suddenly sinking, with the water nearly over half the vessel and the ship angling toward the depths. What are you doing? Ivorn shouted. But Eliu did not respond. Part 3. Under. Avern rushed over to where Eliu was, but just before he struck him with his staff, the joined metal arms began to hum louder, and a shimmering veil enveloped the Ayla sunrise. The water at the front of the ship was pushed beyond the veil, and the entire Ayla sunrise dove into the depths. We will go a constant speed, Eliu said. When I do this with one of my own vessels, I simply adjust the sails as I would as if on top of the ocean to ascend and descend. We must go to the gateway of the city. Eliu smiled and waved his hands around as Evern slowly recoiled. The ocean was all around them. Valrin kept the heading as directed, slowing the ship to descend further, but also looking around at the massive fish swimming over top the ship itself. A monstrous form passed beneath them and then over them. Valrin noticed there were several of these creatures. Each of the massive fish had large jewels atop their heads. Whales, Eliu said. Silence. Absolute silence. There was no sound around them except for that of them breathing. As the Ayla sunrise dropped further into the depths of the ocean, more creatures swam past them. There were colorful fish the size of horses, with glowing fins, smaller octopuses, and a massive eel much larger than any Valrin had ever seen back on his home island of Trava. Ahead of them, he could see glowing orbs in the darkness far beneath them. Beyond that were shells formed into structures of some kind, with much activity buzzing around them. We must place the ship on the floor of the ocean beside the two large torches. It is there we will enter the water. Can we not proceed to the tower? Ordak questioned. We are not on the surface. No, but do not fear. I have a plan. Eliu took out several leaves and pieces of coral. He laid them on the deck and began crushing them with a small blade he kept in his boot. These are leaves from the elven nurseries, used to protect new elves as they receive their first blessings from Etha. Within them is a life-preserving balm that when mixed with crushed coral from the water you wish to enter, it will allow your body to live by simply breathing that which surrounds you. Water? Bry asked. How can an herb allow that? How can it not? Eliu laughed. Too often we give energy to negative questions instead of the ones that will solve such problems. Just as I have studied the very crystals that I am sure have saved your life that are upon this ship, it is not without risk and a chance of result that those such as myself sail forward in life. Trust this Dwemhar, Rusis. If only we worked as one, we could do so much more in life. Ever knelt and rubbed the mixture with the end of his staff. The compound sparkled for a moment, but nothing else. Do you eat it? he asked. Eliu laughed again. No. In fact, you start by putting a bit on your finger like this. He rubbed the substance and then waited for Evern to do the same. The shadow elf looked back at Valrin and then to Ordak. If this kills me, kill him. Ordak laughed and put his hand on one of his blades. Eliu gulped. Just do it. Just do it. I assure you it is fine. Fine is a word of opinion. Evern reached down and rubbed the substance. Now what? That's it! Nothing is happening. The Dwemar closed his eyes. Evern lifted into the air and was thrown off the deck of the ship into the water beyond the veil. Rossi, his serpent, quickly swam back through the veil and jumped onto the deck, hissing. Ordak had his blade out, but Evern's staff was alight. Bubbles rolled out of his mouth, and he began to swim around, smiling. It worked, Ordak said, sheathing his blade. Well, of course it did. Rossi went to the helm and curled up beside Valrin. As the Ayla sunrise floated near the gateway to the city, Valrin placed the ship on the bottom of the ocean floor. 
All the others had already touched the substance, and now he did the same. He didn't feel strange, but as each of his crew jumped through the veil around the ship and began swimming around, he felt a tingling in his chest. He then felt a sensation of pressure on either side of his chest wall. He felt a pinch, and though he could still breathe, he didn't feel as comfortable. He looked to Rossi. No herbs for you? You do not wish to join your master? Rossi hissed. Touchy, Valrin said, laughing. Nay. Nee. He stood on the deck of the ship and looked to the others waiting for him. He leaped from the deck and into the water. He instantly was weightless. He could feel nothing but the warm water around his body. As he breathed, the water was cool within his chest, but it was nothing that he could describe in a simple way, but to say that it was like a very foggy morning upon the ocean. He could feel and taste the salt, and while his breath felt heavy, he did not choke. He began to swim with the others, Elio well ahead of them, but moving through the water with ease. They passed through the torches and were able to step down onto the ground. Once we are within the city, we'll be able to communicate as normal. Eliu spoke to each of them using his Dwemhar powers. As they walked in this underwater world, sharks swam just above them, barely noticing them. Several crabs recoiled to hide in lines of colorful reef. On either side of the roadway were white crescent shells with glimmers of jewels upon them. The actual gateway made up of two sections of a massive reef were ahead of them. The gateway was a giant structure made of two spiraling blue shells with large purple crabs at either side of the gateway, and just beyond the crabs, two myrrh stood watching their approach. Eliu moved ahead of the others and bowed before the gateway, having some form of conversation with those at the gate. He made several motions to those behind him, and the two myrrh nodded, motioning with their fins to move forward. I told them that we wish to honor Meridas with offering and prayer. We have been granted passage to the temple. Step one. As they proceeded through the gateway, Valrin felt it become much easier to breathe. Beyond the gateway, they were standing not in water anymore, but another substance. It was like water, but thinner, it seemed. Now we can speak as normal. Eliu told them. I am amazed by all of this, Bry exclaimed. Their surroundings had veiled the true beauty of this place. From above, while descending above the Ayla sunrise, Valrin had seen nothing but the ocean floor and buildings, but this place was truly a sight beyond sights. Come, Eliu said, motioning for them to follow him. Looking around, Valrin noticed there were no others like them at all. Those who looked on the visitors to their city took a moment to pause, but didn't seem too surprised. The people here were mostly mermaids, with a few other figures walking around with more fish-like characteristics. The mermaids were completely nude, and while they had faces like those of the crew, they still seemed a bit different, like their faces were an attempt to be similar to the races of men and elf, but that they retained their own characteristics and were still uniquely their own. There were no streets like in a typical city, but passageways of sand through coral walls. Beyond the coral were structures of shell that one could enter from the top, but Valrin didn't see any doors of the traditional sense. They were headed to a large tower that could be seen from any part of the city. From within the walls of the city, the tower appeared as a curved shell, with schools of fish swimming around it in groups so large that they appeared as one solid force darting back and forth, even as whales passed through the veil of the city and continued their journey unhindered by the differing atmosphere. Eliu led them toward the city center, where a spinning whirlpool became visible by the fish swimming in and out of the current. The whirlpool ascended high above the city, and passing it, Valrin did not see a bottom to this object. I guess it is like where we'd expect a fountain, Bry suggested. Valrin nodded, and it was then that one of the mermaids stopped him. You are the Stormborn, a servant of Meridas. This mermaid seemed much older. Her skin was rough, and she had scars from some kind of fighting along her face. Valrin noticed she was blind. Stormborn! 
she said again. Your path is perilous. Do not continue. Do not continue. At this point, Avern had stopped and was watching the interchange. Elihu moved back toward Valrin and pulled him forward. Bry followed. The woman just stared at them. There are some that old age has indeed ruined their minds. It is better we do not mess with the older of the mermaids, and especially the sirens like her. Siren. Yes, though when they are younger, they're much fiercer. The older ones tend to lose toughness with the reality of life. She knew I was the stormborn. Eliu paused, looking back at the woman. He closed his eyes for a moment and pushed Valrin on. Valrin glanced back, curious of the siren. The elder siren grabbed her head and slowly fell to the ground. What did you do? Valrin asked. What is necessary? We cannot risk you being known here. Valrin felt sick in his stomach to what had just happened. Surely a single person knowing him, especially one already deemed to have an ill mind, was not such a travesty, or so he wondered. But Ilyu was unamused and uncaring of Valrin's concern. We need to first make offering on the temple grounds. From there, we will proceed into the temple. The temple grounds were the first of many elevated platforms that rose from the ocean floor with a series of steps that ascended higher and higher after each landing. The first of the landings had a silver gate, the second, gold, the third, pink coral, and the final was made of pearls. Small whirlpools were at the base of each gateway. As they approached the first one, Elihu stayed back. You must be purified he told them. Just step into it? Evern asked. Yes, it is meant to cleanse you. Evern and Valrin both looked at one another. Go on, Ordak said. Be cleansed. Valrin could tell the half-orc wanted to laugh. Evern and Valrin stepped into the whirlpools. The water twisted around him, moving up and down his body. The force of the water lessened, and he stepped out. See? Not too bad, Eliu said. Go on, Bry and Ordak. As the other two stepped into the whirlpools, Eliu quickly stepped through the whirlpools and stood beside Valrin. Do you not need to be cleansed? Evern asked. Yes, but I shall not be. I have nefarious thoughts. Such thoughts would alert the temple guards, and we can't have that. So the cleanse does do more than you claimed, Valrin asked. Much is more than I claim, but we are trying to save your friend, and to do that, we need the pearl within the temple. Do not question my actions, please, and keep moving. We cannot mess with the balance of time. The occurrence of you being here in the first place is such a risk. I cannot believe I would take it unless there was truly a desperate reason on my end. The fact that I know my flying machines exist scares me in a way you will not understand. It means, at some point, I either decide to allow them to do what I do not want them to, or am forced. I desired peace, and if we're not careful here, we could have war upon us quite quickly. Now, let us proceed. They continued up each set of stairs and across the landings to the gates. As they made it to the Gate of Pearls, it was here that two mermaids in flowing pearls floated above them and bowed. What blessings do you seek of Meridas within his abode? Reverence, Valrin said. My crew and I have come to pay homage to the one who protects us. All of them bowed to the mermaids. Then proceed. Please keep your heads bowed as you approach the base of the temple. Bow twice at the door and proceed to the altar. Valrin nodded and they continued. Beyond the gateway of the temple... There was open ground of white sand between the walls of the temple and the actual base of spiraled shell. The sand, of a finer powder than the rest of the ocean floor, sparkled as they walked through it. Several seahorses floated past them, and Bry laughed as one hung out on her shoulder. They're almost like fairies, she said. Except they don't have the healing properties when ground up, Evern said. Eliu. We have come to pay homage, and I truly question how you intend to take the pearl we need. 
Where is it? Should we not have formed a plan well before this moment? There is strife within this place. We must ascend upward. That is what I can tell you. From there, we'll see what transpires. As they came to the doorway of the temple, they bowed twice as they were told. It was here that more of the whirlpools spun atop platforms of shell on either side of the opening. Much like torches, these whirlpools glowed with an arcane light along the temple and within it. As they entered the temple, there were several others before an effigy of Meridas, but it was the break in the crowd as another group walked through the base of the temple that caused Valrin and the others to pause. It was three figures, each of them wearing brown cloaks with silver gauntlets on their arms. You are correct, one of them said, speaking to a rather tall siren who had a toothed sword at her hip. The Rusis do not deal with tragedies with such disregard as the Dwemar. We will proceed to Iliaka and speak with the council there. They cannot ignore the murder of your prince, and we will not stand for such disdain toward our underwater friends. Thank you, kind Rusis. We had thought that we had no other to trust in this moment of tragedy. The Dwemhar toy with mechanical machines of disaster, and we will not allow them to pollute our oceans. It is the will of the Rusis to protect all life. Their actions have caused many to suffer within the seas, and they will pay homage. The siren bowed. Thank you. The Dwemhar have not even come to apologize. They say they had nothing to do with such actions. At this point, Eliu was hiding under his own cloak as Valrin slowly proceeded forward to the altar. He knelt, as did Bry, Evern, and Ordak. Eliu was the last to bow, but Valrin turned as he heard Eliu get pulled back up. Dwemhar, one of the Rusi said, you come to this holy place and do not even apologize to the sirens of this city? I do not know what you speak of, Rusis. I am a simple pilgrim. Eliu said, opening his arms. I had nothing to do with what you spoke of moments before. My people, they do not even care for me. That is correct, the siren said. He is an outsider. He remains to himself and to the reverence of the old ways. The Rusi seemed to trust the words of the siren and released him. Continue with your prayers, Dwemhar, the Rusi said. Rungar, the siren said. Please do not fight with the Dwemhar. I am sure we can come to an agreement of some form. At the mention of Rungar, Valrin and the others took a quick glance at the Rusis. It was him. It was Rungar, but well in the past. Truly, the legendary Rusis was much older than they all imagined. I will not fight them, Rungar said, not unless provoked. A war with the Dwemhar would throw this world asunder, and none within my people wish for that. I will proceed to Eliaka after I have made my offering to Meridas. Is he within his sanctum? Though Valrin could not hear the siren's answer as they had begun to walk away from the altar, he began to hear Eliu whispering, We must ascend. It is there we will find what you seek. Come, follow and do as I do. I have spent much time here, and I have access to what others do not. I see what I must do, though. I fear what will come of it. Eliu stood, moving with his head bowed. He motioned for the others to follow, and they went the opposite way of Rungar, taking a passage that led around the back of the effigy of Meridas, and down a shallow passage that became colder the further they went down. It was here they found an area with a glowing gold disc spinning at the center of a large room. Here, sirens wearing elaborate headdresses of shells bowed before the spinning gold orb. This is the room of the high priests of the sea. This is the source for life within the waters, a treasure of Meridas himself. We near the point of ascension. Eliu went through a side room obviously not a common place for the common worshipper by the ornate narrow rooms and many strangely written runes on the walls. This is an ancient cave system. I have been told this is where the first of the Mir began to learn the knowledge of the seas. Here we move into the final chain of passages. As they snaked through several caves, it became clear there was something Eliu had not said. 
I am sorry, friends, but I forsake much in helping you. I did not wish to say it, but now we are at a truly holy place. What is it you do? Ordak asked. Besides stealing? I am a trusted individual here, known from my time in an awakening between the Dwemhar and the Mare, but cast out because I sought to continue to protect the oceans, while the Dwemhar sought to delve deep into the coral, seeking more precious metals. Sound almost like dwarves, Bry said. No, Elu said. Dwarves are filthy creatures, but I get what you are saying of it. I studied much here, though many do not remember me now. The life of a siren is substantially shorter. Well, we met your older form in the future. You're still not dead. The bending of time is the only known way to prolong your life beyond that which is natural. Valrin noticed that the cave came up to a central point where two large blue shells formed a doorway where what sounded like whooshing water filled the air. Proceeding through the doorway, he saw a waterfall, but the water flowed upward and did not fall at all. There is a split in my people, Elihu said, where once concentration was on improving the inner spirit and the powers of the mind, there are some who have focused on the path of war meant for the protection of our people. Truly we can build wondrous objects, but I fear what will come of all of this. One path of ascension is the oldest of our beliefs, that of transcendence from this living realm to another, but another, one of machinery and flight, seems to be what my people tumble toward. All around you, this wondrous place is at threat, and my people do not even care to apologize for what has happened. What kind of ascension and growth of spirit can one have when evil still dwells within them? Shall they preach to the masses of how they should live while darkness clenches their own hearts? Elio stood before the strange reverse waterfall. Or why do I speak of goodness when I am about to create my own darkness? He paused. But I sent you here. I knew this was the purpose of why you were here. This must be the path I am to take. I must trust these actions to the intended purpose. He looked at them. We ascend to the upper tower. There we will have what we seek. Valrin, he said, looking at just the captain. Once we reach the upper level, do not worry of your crew or my actions. Simply place all your thought on your vessel underneath the weight of the ocean. Focus. See the ship before you. Do only that, and perhaps we can escape without harm. He looked to the others. Pacify. Do not kill. When we pass through the portal, Rusus, freeze the passage behind us. I will, Bry said. Eliu sighed. May this path remain true. Eliu stepped into the water and shot upward. The others did the same. Valrin gasped as he entered the stream, and in an instant felt himself rushing up the length of the massive tower. He looked out, seeing the expanse of the underwater world and spotting a ship on the outskirts of the city. A few more moments and they had risen above the surface and all before him he saw the expanse of the sea and the encircling mountains. He was amazed at this sight, this imagery of the glacial seas before the flooding. He wondered of the rest of the lands, the elves who dwelled in the southern lands, the dwarves and even the Rusi cities that he knew existed. His own race, the race of men, were infantile right now as a culture if they even fully existed. It was difficult to know what time period it was, but for this sliver of time, the horror of the events under the Black Moon, the darkness of Iaclo, all of it faded away to a feeling of oneness with the lands and all that existed within it. He emerged from the water with Bry to his side, flashes and blasts cut by him, and in an icy blast, Bry immediately began sealing the passage. Ordok had his blades out and was guarding her as Mare came into the re-emergence chamber. Evern cast a weakened blast from his staff, knocking back the mermaids or whatever these were. They did not have tails as fish, and they were no longer underwater. Sirens! Eliu shouted. Back in the name of the Dwemhar of the Living Realm! You are subservient to the will of the Conclave! Bow before me! 
Eliu lifted his hand, and a metal attachment now on his wrist burst to life, sending a blinding flash toward the sirens. The creatures themselves had legs like Valrin and wore simple garbs across their chests that hung down to their knees. In their hands were staves with bright pearl tips that, as more of them poured in from the edges of the room, fell unconscious to the power of Eliu's device. Valrin, he said as he pointed to one of the doorways, outside, we must ascend to the top, but begin your mediation. Call out to your ship. The Rusis ice wall will not hold. Bry jeered. My wall is quite strong. I think you'll be surprised. Suddenly, a blast of energy surged through the icy wall. Rungar is one of the most powerful of the Rusis race. Trust me that your powers are indeed less than his. They ascended from the room, and the warmth of the outside and the rushing winds over the towers was a much-needed breath of air from the underwater world. It was here, spinning at a slow pace at the pinnacle of the tower, they found a large pearl. It sat in a pool of silver water that had small bolts of lightning that charged tiny poles that came out of the center. Valrin glanced at it a second time, seeing now that there were several of these portals. Stormborn! Evern shouted. Focus! Valrin nodded. Turning away from the others, he closed his eyes and began to take deep breaths. He could feel his pulse in his throat, a nervous pounding as he felt the energies in the chamber below them growing. He saw his ship in his eye. He could feel a strong pulling upon the center of his forehead, and he kept his focus on his ship, almost as if visualizing it directly before him, though he knew such a thought was impossible. But strangely, as he focused on this one thought, he felt a slight ringing in his ears and a tinge of sensation running to his forehead. Look at him, he heard Bry say. But he could not open his eyes. He only saw the Ayla sunrise floating through the water. He saw a flash of white and then opened his eyes. The Ayla sunrise floated before him at the top of the tower. Bry was beside him. Valrin, your forehead, it was glowing. He tapped into what has long been dormant, and will likely be inaccessible to him once he leaves this time. But now you see the potential of even those who are not of pure Dwemhar blood. You're saying he is part Dwemhar? Even asked. He is tied to our race. I have felt it since he arrived. Eliu had grabbed several of the pearls with the same metallic device on his wrist and was levitating them. The shimmering silver pool before them was now spinning violently, sending bolts of lightning at random into the top of the tower. A blast rocked the tower. We must flee! They are coming! Valrin and the others ran for the Ayla sunrise, still floating just next to the tower. As Valrin leaped to the deck, he noticed the metal device at the rear of the ship was glowing. He went to the helm just as many red orbs shot upon the deck. Sirens were pointing their staves at them. Evern crafted a ward, but then Eliu reached out, the pearls spinning before him. As he pointed to the top of the tower, a blast of silver overtook the sirens, shooting them out the sides of the tower and blasting apart the tower itself. Go! Now! Valrin spun the wheel, and the ship turned from the tower, quickly descending to the ocean, but as if floating like a bird. As they struck the ocean, Eliu ran along the edges of the deck. He was watching the water. So far we have escaped, but indeed I have sinned greatly. Keep this heading. We return to Eliaka, and with any hope, I have killed those who saw this ship. You said not to harm anyone, Ordak said. Certain events are unavoidable. The war between the great races happens regardless. I just had hoped I did not have such a hand in this. Rungar goes to Eliaka. Will not the Dwemhar have an answer to whatever the Rusis attempts? Bry asked. I do not expect the Rusis to outright attack the Conclave, but I wonder of my own people. They are erratic, ever since the wars against the demons, where Rusis and Dwemhar warriors fought one another. Have you heard of the Dwemhar Riakar? I know this name. Evern said. 
Ryakar is a hero of our race, a skilled warrior who wields two blades that never leave his side, even in times of peace. I worry of Rungar, for he and Ryakar are friends, but both are fiercely loyal to their own races. Where is Ryakar? Evern asked. He is at Eliaka in a state of meditation, as are most of the Grandmasters. Such events are trivial to your cause, but now I see how war may come. Once we get back to the city, I will need but one object, and I can direct you back to your own time. As for the weapon to deactivate Ayaklo, I will begin immediately. Part 4. Embers Catching They had not been sailing long, and Eliyu was already revealing he seemed to have a second nature to the workings of the ship. He had opened the device his much older self had installed and was using the bracelet he wore on his wrist to construct a device out of seemingly nothing. In a few moments he had a large metal frame that was pointed like some type of ballistae. Is this a weapon? Ordak asked. Not in a sense that you may expect, the Dwemhar responded. This device deactivates the energy between metallic components. Ayaklo is like a machine, not too much unlike this vessel. At one time, Ayaklo would have floated in the sky much like the work I do on our Valakana. Your flying vessels? Valren asked. Yes, and it is this knowledge I fear my people obtaining, because I know what will happen, and I do not have to hold knowledge of the future to assume this. But it seems war comes regardless of that, Evern said. The crash in the ocean, the Rusi's agents. You are right. So we will see what good I can do in the future by my actions now. He looked back to Ordok. As it is, this device could be used as a traditional weapon. It would not cause outward harm, but beneath the skin, it would disrupt vessels within living and breathing life. Valren had kept a watch on the seas around them. Though he wished to return directly to Eliaka, Eliu had said to stay at sea for now, so he did that. Now, however, there was another vessel, and this vessel was closing in on them. Evurn, Valren said. Do you see our guest? Yes. The ship was a dark black in color, with red sails. Though at first it did not seem to be heading their way at all, Valren could tell it was gaining on them. Eliu, it is time to go. I'm increasing the power. No, I must finish my work. The Dwemhar glanced up at the ship gaining on them. Never mind. That is a Rusus vessel. He made several adjustments to the device and then slid a lever into place, securing the attachment with the pearls with a blast of fire. Go! We need to get away from them! Valren turned off his current course, cutting across the water and heading further away from the towering mountain where the Dwemhar city was. A bolt of lightning shot into the water near them from the Rusus vessel. Do not engage! Eliu said. We must not reveal this ship's technology. Does this ship run off crystal energy, or is it liquid metals? I have no idea what you're talking about, Valren said. But crystals power the ship as best I understand. I have never seen liquid metals capable of powering anything. Valren motioned for the rear of the ship, and Eliu ran for the crystal components. Curse this! If it were metal, I could increase the output. The flying ships run on such material? Evern asked. Yes, it is a toxic substance, but if electrified, it is capable of massive power output. I have intentionally kept this power subdued in the eyes of the Conclave. Crystals are a longer-term solution, but without a more powerful crystal, I cannot increase the output to what we need. The Rusus vessel was nearly upon them, but it wasn't attempting to board them as another vessel might. In a flash of flame, a figure appeared before them. Evorn and Ordak jumped to action. The half-orc drew his blades, and Evorn cast a ward. The figure was Rungar, and he lifted his hands. Strangers, he said, I do not know your faces save the Dwemhar with you. By order of the Rusis Templars, you will cease your flight. Valren kept his hands firmly on the wheel of the ship. Rungar, Eliu said, you must return to your vessel. This does not concern you. Rungar was scanning the ship, noticing the crystals behind Valren and the device on the lower deck. 
This is no Dwemhar vessel that I know. You, you people, you're not of the Dwemhar at all. Rungar, I implore you to return to your vessel. Take your concerns to the Conclave in Eliaka. The Conclave works without my hand, for I refuse to help them further. Your people have always been about peace and mindfulness, but these constructs must stop. Even now, I wonder of this vessel, and in such, I will ask one more time for you to lower the sails. I do not wish strife between us, but there are too many questions right now. Bri ignited her spells in her hands, and Rungar was upon her almost instantaneously. The ruses held her against the railing of the ship, and Evern contracted his ward as Ordak lunged for Rungar. Another flash of magic streaked across the ship, and another rusus blocked Rungar, throwing him down to the ground and drawing a staff that undulated with lightning. Back! In the name of the Rusus Templars! Valrin had left the wheel, his own sword drawn and now pointed at Rungar. The Rusis gripped Bri by the throat. You are a traitor to your people to be with these Dwemhar. Tell me, what Templar order do you belong to? What city? Bri pushed back. No order, Rungar. Stop. Do not speak to me as if you know me. Don't! Evern shouted. Do not tell him! The Rusis with the staff sent sparks toward Evern. Do not interfere with the business of Templars! Evern held his own staff out, summoning magic to use at a moment's need. All of you! You must stop! Elayu begged. Speak! Rungar shouted at Bri. Speak, or I shall immolate you here! Bri pushed against Rungar again. I am of the glacial seas, crew under Valrin, the captain of this vessel. I know no glacial seas. That is because from where we come from, Valrin said. This is all underwater, these mountains, these lands, everything. Rungar kept his grip on Bri, staring into her eyes. That is impossible. It isn't. But they have worse news, Elayu said. A war is coming, Rusus. A war between our people that will destroy all of us. This crew has a hand in preventing further harm in the future. There are no Dwemhar cities in the future, Evern said. Nor are there Rusis. Both Rungar and the other Rusis looked to the Shadow Elf. The details do not matter, Elayu said. But these people are not from our time. I must keep that a secret. If we are to help the future, I need to get to Eliaka, and I need to ensure they can leave this realm. Rungar released Bri. He signaled for his ship that was following along to cease pursuit, and Valrin lowered the sails. Both vessels slowed to a stop, and Rungar said nothing for a while, looking at all of them. At last he looked to Bri. My apologies, Rusus, but you must understand this is difficult for me. But you are Rusus. Tell me of the cities in your time. What have the Ruses become? No, Eliu cut in. The state of the Ruses and the Dwemhar in their time is not relevant to now. I know you go to the Conclave, and I can tell you they will deny any wrongdoing. Another Ruses appeared on deck. Rungar looked at the newest who had arrived. We go to Eliaka, he said. I seek peace. We, Templars of the Ruses, seek peace. This here, with the Staff of Lightning, is Varus. The other, her sister, Narai. Both have vows of silence as my apprentices. They are but students to a future world. I do not know what to say of your others, but surely the Dwemhar will understand that the future should not be touched. No, Iliu said. The Conclave must not know of them or this vessel's origin. I do not even know why a seafaring vessel would be like this but it is not my place to know. I already know enough in that our world is flooded and that war decimates our people. Will you please just allow us to leave? Perhaps you can distract the conclave? Rungar stroked his chin. Valrin noticed that unlike the Rungar of their time, this man had a well-groomed beard that was as dark as the Rus's ship. It doesn't take a Dwemhar to know my thoughts are broken on this. I know the worries you have of me knowing the future, Eliu, but my only hope is for peace. Your conclave has become consumed with power. 
not too much like my own masters. I miss the time of the wars against the demons when I and Ryakar fought together. Perhaps my brother in arms can be of use to us? Ryakar serves the Conclave. Though he may not agree with every action, he is of them. I am a wanted man within my people. Rungar sighed. Okay, I do not know you, Valrin, but I have to hope you would wish for peace as I do. I do, always. But I am prepared to do what is necessary to protect my crew. Rungar bowed to Bry. My apologies, Rusus. Know that you see your race at a time of great strife. I must hope that in another life I would protect you as you deserve. Valrin noticed it seemed Bry wanted to speak, but instead smiled alone. Rungar had protected her and all of them in Taria, but they could not speak of such things. I trust you here. In my own city of Rinagres, many have seen the future and claim it is dark. Yet, I still see that Rusus live. I will fight to protect that which has become, he said, looking to his apprentices. But I will do my best to keep the path of peace as long as I can. As Ryakar said to me once, to keep a path of peace is but a path to true life. And I do hope I can remind him of that if the Conclave will speak to us. The realm of Meridas has been harmed, and it is our place in the world to not allow the lesser races to fight. It is why the great poet has charged elves, dwarves, Rusis, and Dwemhar with guarding the living realm, and I will hold to that law. In flashes of flame, the Rusis returned to their vessel and said nothing else to Valrin or the others. We must hurry. I do not feel the Conclave will take the words of the Rusis well. Though there have been many events leading to this, I do not want you and the crew drawn into a fight, Iliu said to Valrin. Take us to Eliaka. I will work hastily to complete what is needed and get the device to the level you need. The Dwemhar was back at work immediately. As Valrin raised the sails again, the Rusis vessel had already vanished from sight. They take a different path from us, Eliu said, looking up from his work. Vessels that are not of Dwemhar origin normally take a lower harbor and then ascend. He pointed in a general direction just off from where Valrin was headed. This way just a bit. Aim for the glowing rock and we'll enter the portal to return from where we left. Do you not worry that our enemy will wait for us? The arrival of the Rusis will work to our advantage. As such, our path has become clear. Valrin kept the Aela sunrise angled as directed. The massive mountain before them, with many waterfalls falling off the higher levels of the rocky face, was a surreal sight, especially in a region that in his own time was a frigid dark sea. A few moments passed, and Valrin felt the ship begin to increase in speed, and in a few moments they passed up into the clouds and emerged in the lake beside the city. Evorn, Ordak, and Bry were on edge, their weapons and spells ready to act, but Eliu was now the most erratic. I sense them. They're close, he said. Go to the cove and then to the dock. I will have to work quickly. Valrin went toward the cove and Eliu disembarked. The device is almost complete. I will only need a few more modifications. I need to look up one small thing within my home. Please stay aboard your vessel no matter what. Dwemhar, Evern said. Will they not be looking for you? One of us should assist you. If such a need happens, it will be too late. You're on the eve of a war, Shadow Elf, perhaps the day of. Your ship is yet incomplete, but I have a failsafe. I pray I do not need to use it, for it will require even more work on your part. But if I tell you to flee, just go. Do not fight. Elio stared at each of them and then focused on Valrin. Protect your crew, Captain. You already know the fate of my people. With that, the Dwemhar vanished into the cave. Evorn went to the helm with Valrin as Bry and Ordak stood below them. We wait for him, Valrin said, and clearly we flee if he so tells us to. The captain directed the ship to the docks, but unlike last time, there were quite a few onlookers who seemed to take interest in them. We should not have come here. Ordak said, 
not after our exit. We did not have a choice, Bry said. He must hurry. I do not trust any of these Dwemhar. Ivorn moved from the helm down to where the others were talking. Silence yourselves. Keep your minds as solid as you can. Do not let your thoughts wander. These on the docks are sentries, and while I agree that he must hurry, we do not have many options beyond remaining calm. Though remaining calm was soon to become much more difficult. One of the Dwemhar walked to the rail of the ship. Valren swallowed a nervous bit of saliva and sighed. Who is captain? Valren bowed. I, Master Dwemhar. Evern had his staff in hand, but made a motion for Ordak to calm himself as the half-orc went for his weapons. Then please know that the Dwemhar do not seek further fighting with you. Your ship does not hide, and we can tell it is not of our fleet or of any fleet we know. Now, Valrin, we must go, Ordak shouted. The half-orc drew his axe and went to fling it at the Dwemhar, when suddenly he began to float just above the deck. Evern swung his staff out, halting Bry from revealing her powers. Several Dwemhar now floated just above the surface of the water, with the golden crowns atop their heads glowing brightly. We do not seek altercation, Evern shouted out. Then come, the Dwemhar said. I am to take you to the Conclave. Valrin looked to Evern and released his grip on the wheel of the ship. Your ship. The Aeola Sunrise is safe, Valrin of Trava, the Dwemhar said. I am Avar, an arbiter of the Conclave, second rank to Riakar. He, among others, await you. As they slowly exited the ship, Ordak was the last to exit and was not allowed his weapons. Leave them aboard your ship and you will be allowed passage, one of the guards said. Ordak grumbled and did as asked, stomping onto the dock. Follow, Evar said. As they exited the docks, Valrin caught sight of Eliu in the distance in the cave. He sunk away into the shadows, and Valrin looked ahead. They passed through the gate and went a completely different path from what Valrin and the others took when they'd first arrived. They did not pass by Eliu's house, but instead went to the far left, and to a road that ascended through massively tall spires higher into the pointed mountains on the edge of the world, or so it seemed. As the road went upward, they came to a white bridge that scaled between two mountains, and beneath them, far below them, blue water met the massive sea they had been upon and beneath before. Clouds rolled off the mountaintops and under the bridges. This mountain was not as the place before, having many spired buildings as well, but with golden domes and crystals that sat at the top of the buildings. Here, Valrin heard chanting, melodic and strong. A single bell tolled as they proceeded around the mountainous region to yet another series of stairs that went further up into the sky. Where do you take us, Avar? Evorn asked. To the lower temple grounds, a gathering place. Already representatives of the Rusis Templar have arrived in the lower regions of the city, and no, they did not tell us of you. We cannot see their minds as it is. Valrin noticed at the Dwemhar's mention of this, he seemed strangely perturbed. He looked down at Valrin, his raiment flowing off his shoulders as if there were wind moving it, yet Valrin felt no breeze. Avar's eyes glowed slightly and he smiled. Do not worry, young one. We mean you no harm here at Elieka. The number of stairs they were traversing was more than Valrin had ever seen in one place. The air here smelled sweet, like fruit, but he did not see any fruit yet, only white flowers growing beyond a golden silver fence and a garden beneath a tower in the mountains. That place is an honorary home to the elves when they visit us here in Eliaka. Beneath the mountains we have a place for the dwarves. And the Rusis? Bry asked. They have a place too, but that is not of concern at the moment to you and your companions. As they reached another line of structures with domed cathedrals that climbed up the mountains, they passed through a gateway 
and came to a courtyard with several glowing obelisks that rose high into the sky. Valrin looked up as several Dwemhar dressed in white with gold tassels flowing in the wind descended to their level. Your people can fly? Bry asked. Some, Evar said, but it is not flight as would a bird or dragon fly. There are many powers of the mind, both benevolent and malevolent. We Dwemhar do our best to focus on the good, lest the void will open once more, and we will be forced to fight the evil ones. Valrin didn't know what evil ones he spoke of, and he did not have time to question. They had come to a building that was at the focal point of several half-moon rocks that floated over pools of water that glimmered in the daylight. You will proceed here, Evar said. The conclave will speak to you as they wish, and we will determine your next path. As the Dwemhar around them dispersed, they were corralled into a single structure lit with glowing torches that appeared like fire, yet were not fire at all. Some kind of spell, Evern said. Not Dwemar as I know it. This isn't good. He spat, looking back toward the entrance fading behind them. We need to get back to the ship. And how do we do that? Bry asked. These are Dwemhar, not foolish dwarves or elves. For now, we must follow the Stormborn, Evern said. Valrin glanced at him and then back forward. They were coming to another doorway, and even before they reached it, the doors parted before them. They passed on to a balcony, and before them was a massive room with many figures seated on chairs within alcoves covering an entire wall. Two Dwemhar were on either side of them. These four guards formed a line behind them, blocking their exit. Travelers from afar, a voice spoke. I speak as this so it will be familiar. You share the space with other guests. A shimmering veil faded to their right, and he saw Rungar, Narai, and Varus, the Rusis from before. Their minds are hidden from us, a device of their people. The figure speaking floated down atop a single slab of stone as if it were a ship upon the sea, yet it was not on water. The figure did not have weapons. He was small and very old. He had a long silver beard twisted in braids and white hair. His eyes glimmered like sparkling water. You are Valrin of Trava, yet I do not see your mind as I should. You are upon a vessel, one which my people are most interested in. I am Terek So, elder member of the Conclave. I wish none of you harm, but you must understand my confusion to your arrival here and your dealings with the one named Eliu. I do not know, Valrin said. Do not know, or do not wish to speak of it. These are different feelings and thoughts. We were brought here, I mean. I do not know how, and I speak as you wish. Terexo nodded. You do, child. Do you believe Eliu to have brought you here? Did he wish something from, I guess, the future? No, I do not know what he wishes of us at this time, but from our time, much has gone astray. Valrin, Evern mumbled. Terexo floated near the Shadow Elf. You, young one, have a dark mind. Do your friends know what you left behind? I see much, much that frightens me, much that makes me sad, and it is not simply what your eyes have seen that make me fear. Then you must understand that we should be allowed to leave. Our presence here is a disruption of time itself. Wisdom does not flee from your mind, Evorn of the East, but within the confines of this room, you are upon grounds of ascension. For a moment, what is spoken here is shielded from the influence of time. Then you must know that we must go, Ordak shouted. We are not supposed to be here. Quiet, Evern said. I am confused as to who is captain of this crew, Terexo said, looking between Valrin and Evern. Shadow Elf, you have fled from your duties of such, so why do you try to rule now? There was silence. Avorn looked down to the ground like a child who had been corrected suddenly. Valrin scanned the many faces staring at them from the high places above. This place, Terexo said to him, does it frighten you? No, but I am at awe that such a place is no more. 
I just know we must depart. They cannot leave, a voice from the assembly behind Terek so shouted. No, we need such devices in our own machines. If Eliu continues to hide, we will have no understanding of that which he has begun. Still another seemed to protest. Developing machines for what some here seek will not lead to ascension, but to ruin. These of the future come in a ship for sailing, not a flying vessel as we have. We must be wary of our path. A debate broke out, yet Valrin could no longer hear the words spoken. He felt the energies in the air leaping across the chasms above them. The room seemed to become warm, and the mountain itself quaked beneath them. Terexo floated up high above them. Our warriors rest as they should, yet you would have me forbid these visitors from the future from leaving. Yet on our very doorstep, those of Meridas's realm beneath the waters have suffered by our own hands. How closer to ascension can we be when I understand that our lower castes did not even offer apologies? The Conclave has been in deep meditation, moving ourselves closer to the ascended realm for all our kind in order to better protect that which we have been charged to protect. And those beneath us fall to darkness and shame. We are but one mind moving across the plains of serenity to enlightenment, and yet we lose brothers. It is the Rusis, someone shouted above. The Rusis disrupt our path. Valrin looked over to Rungar. He and his apprentices had their heads bowed as if in prayer. I have already spoken to Rungar. Valrin heard the voice in his head as clear as if it were spoken. He looked around. He knew the voice. It was Eliu, but the man wasn't next to him. Rungar will protect you. The Rusis have powers to block the energies of my people. When he makes his move, turn and flee. The guards will fall, and you will have a path. Run, Valrin. Do not allow yourself to be captured. Terexo is wise and powerful, but even his mind has been corrupted, and the Conclave is not what it was at one time. Please, do as I say, Valrin. Valrin looked to Evern, but the Shadow Elf's gaze was to Terexo above. It is not the Rusis, Terexo said. We come to a split in our path, and I already feel our said path is folly. Valrin felt the air around him turn icy cold, and he looked to Bry. Rungar was upon their landing with his apprentices. A shimmering ward of magic shot outward, enveloping the guards around them. Go! he shouted. Valrin grabbed Bry's hand as Ordok and Avern followed behind. Stop them! In the name of the Conclave! A voice thundered behind them. Rungar ran amidst them, his hands held above his head and the ward he casted holding strong. As they reached the outside world, repeated blasts struck the ward, but it did not falter. Apprentices, keep channeling your powers to our sides. We must get them to the harbor and to their ship. We cannot allow the Dwemhar to gain that of the future. They came to the gateway, which slammed shut in front of them. Several Dwemhar floated into the sky above them. Rungar leaped into the air, summoning swords of flame, cutting into their forms but sparing their lives. He tries to respect that which is the path of time in our world, but every move he makes risks our future, Evan said. They came to the locked gate, and in an explosion of fire, the Ruses melted the gateway. One by one, they jumped past the molten gateway, and continued on. They were now on the bridge, and from the high places of the mountains, horns sounded across the peaks. Dwemhar floated alongside them, and several more trumpets blared. A flash erupted from the high pinnacle of Iliaka and streaked down, landing in the lower city. Valrin noticed a line of Dwemhar were assembled in front of them. Rungar fell back within the group of them. Keep your minds focused on me he said. Do not let yourself wander, or you will be snatched by our enemy. My head, Ordak said. I can feel them. They are attempting to stop us. 
They are attempting to kill you. They would sever the vessels in your brain if it were not for our protection. The Rusis Templar protect you, half-orc. They were nearly to the line of Dwemhar warriors. While they had glowing eyes, as did the others of their race, their weapons were of typical material of the time, though of an unknown substance to Valrin. Evorn Bray, cast your wards when I say. They were still running at full speed when Rongar shouted, Now! Avern and Bry summoned their wards as the Rusi's Templars lunged forward, sending shards of ice in an explosion of white and blue, throwing back the entire line of Dwemhar in a line of ice. Valrin and the others kept running. The Rusis broke off from them, taking down individual sentries dotting the rooftops as those within the city fled from the explosions and spellcasting. Valrin could see his ship ahead. Rungar brought his two apprentices back to Valrin and the others. They have summoned the others. Their warriors descend upon this place. Were these not their warriors? Bry asked. You have no idea, young one, he said. You are under my protection. I will not let harm befall you. They had reached the outer gateway. The way was open. Valrin began to sprint ahead of the rest as he then saw a lone figure standing on the docks. Rungar shot ahead of Valrin and stopped him. Ivorn lifted his staff as an entire host of Dwemhar had followed them and floated like a great host in the skies above as more and more who were not using their powers to hover above the ground formed ranks in a half moon around the harbor. Rungar, you cause trouble in my home, the lone figure said. My brother, please, you cannot be of the mind of the Conclave. You and I fought the demons of our world together. You are above these foolish, short-sighted miscreants of your race. It has been a long time since those days, and I have been aboard this ship. I also captured the one we sought. At this point, the figure pointed, and Valrin saw that Eliu was in custody of several Dwemhar guards. All is set for now, Valrin. Flee this place. Activate the device. You will be taken to where you need to be next. No one will flee, a voice cut in. Crew from time ahead, the figure said. I am Rhea Carr, and by order of the Dwemar Conclave, you are to halt your flight. These Rusis have assaulted those within our holy... Rungar and the Rusis' apprentices summoned their spells, forming a circle of energy around the crew. By order of the Rus's Templar of Rinagrace, this crew is under the eternal protection of the Rus's Templar caste. Any Dwemhar who attempts to stop them will be answered with the powers of our people. Riakar smirked. Old friend, such folly. Rungar smashed the ground, sending a blast of earth magic into Riakar and throwing the Dwemhar up and over the crew. Valrin spotted their path. Go! he shouted. As they ran for the Aeola sunrise, the Rusis formed a wall of magic, layering their spells in such a way that a great ward shot high into the sky that rippled with gold bolts of energy. The three Rusis formed a triangle with a white orb at their center. The sunlight was darkened upon the waters. The ships that had surrounded the Aeola sunrise were engulfed with the Rusi's flames. Cast off, Valrin shouted, hurrying to the helm. Ordak cut the lines holding the ship, and Valrin wheeled left to move away from the shore. A thundering sound cut through the air, and suddenly Rhea Carr was aboard the Aela Sunrise. He drew two blades and pointed them at Valrin. I have spoken, and what I have stated is law within Iliaka. Evorn put himself between the swordsman and Valrin. Bry's spells were ready, and Ordak drew his axe. Really? Has it come to this that the lesser races believe they can come against the Dwemhar? A blast of fire struck across the deck, and Riakar was blown back to the front of the ship. Rungar appeared with smoke and blue fire around his body. He channeled a blast of electrified energy sizzling with the sounds of lightning toward the Dwemhar. Riakar cut through the spell with his blades, spinning high above Rungar and diving down upon him. In a shearing crossed explosion of magic, Rungar summoned blades of white fire, 
blocking the attack. Flee! Rungar shouted. He gripped Rhea Kar, and in an eruption of spells, they took to the skies above the ship, dueling back and forth. Several other Dwemhar followed just behind them. One of the apprentices landed on the ship as three Dwemhar gripped the ship with their powers. Brae and the apprentice cast their spells at the Dwemhar before them, and in a sudden shriek, the apprentice was cut, slashed into by Riakar, now back upon the deck. The Rusis had been nearly severed in half. The bleeding corpse fell off the edge of the ship, and it was Ordak who charged Riakar, seeing as the Dwemhar was nearly upon Bry. Riakar parried the half-orc with ease and laughed, but it was Evern's staff that ceased his laughing, striking the warrior in the face. Rungar was aboard the ship again, and as flames rippled from his body, he threw the Dwemhar across the ship. Valrin had been attempting to activate the device Eliu had placed on the ship. It seemed to be charging and had been the entire time they were sailing. Many Dwemhar vessels were converging, and now the other apprentice joined Rungar on the ship. Ivorn kept his staff up to shield Valrin, and Brae did the same to Ordak. Riakar's blades rolled with white fire, and Rungar and his apprentice circled around the Dwemhar. This is folly. You cannot believe that this ship is worth the bloodshed you enact here. And of your own people, the Rusis? Why did they attack our city in the southern mountains? Rungar looked at Riakar, confused. I know nothing of that. Our city was engulfed in ice by a trio of Rusis just like you three. Rungar shook his head. I know nothing of this. I must speak to the High Council immediately and see to it that... Riakar lunged backward, taking the other apprentice by surprise and sending a spray of red blood across the deck of the ship. Rungar lunged forward with his spells, engulfing the Dwemhar who then repelled the attack with his own spell of Dwemhar fire. The device on the deck of the ship began to hum. Rungar, off! Evern shouted. Rungar grabbed hold of Riakar and pulled the Dwemhar off the vessel as the ship began to move from the past into the void of time. Good fortune, stranger of the future. Forgive those who do not know the world as you do. You will not see me again. It was the voice of Terek So. Valrin held tight to the wheel as they saw blackness around them, and the air shifted between cold and hot. He then felt the ship descending, not at all like what they had felt going into the past. The device constructed by Eliu seemed to flash and spark, and suddenly Valrin saw red skies around them. Part 5. City of Fire Valrin jerked around, looking for some sign of where or when they were. He saw only clouds. Ordak backed away from the side of the ship. Where's the ocean? The Stormborn realized the red skies surrounding them were more than a sunset or sunrise. The smoke in the air gave out a putrid odor, and the crystals surged behind him. We are flying, Bry pointed out. The Rusis was correct, and as Valrin worked to keep the ship flying in a relatively straight direction, Ordak gripped the center mass. The ship itself was humming, and as they cut through the thick clouds ahead, Valrin could feel the mist rolling over his body. He did not how the ship was flying, or even how to fly the ship, but he felt himself tied within the ship itself. He focused and felt the ship moving downward. At least going down they'd reach water, or so was his thinking. Lightning struck through the clouds, and Evern began to cast a ward. Must be a storm, he said. But then Valrin heard a strange song on the air, a melody of chimes, a sound as if bells were humming. As they pushed through the cloud cover, he saw a massive city beneath them with plumes of smoke coming up from multiple fires. The Ayla sunrise was descending quickly, but that was not the only worry they had. Valrin caught sight of two large objects above them, and in a flash they were directly next to them. They were flying machines large metallic devices that looked nothing like his own vessel. As they flew beside the Ayla sunrise, there was a melody in the wind. Unlike Valrin's ship, these did not look like sailing vessels at all. They were golden orbs with large crystals on their undersides. 
A blast of energy shot down from one of the crystals as they began to descend further into the burning city. Valrin could no longer control the ship. They were going to crash. The two flying vessels stayed with them, sending energy into the buildings beneath them. As strange as it was, these vessels were not targeting them. If they had, they would have already been struck. The crystals at the aft of the ship had darkened. The device installed by Eliui was no longer glowing. Brace yourselves, Valrin shouted. The ship cut through the top of a building and struck a massive tower, tearing apart the front of the vessel. Bry and Avern were thrown from the ship as it toppled to one side. Valrin held onto the wheel but was thrown onto the deck, and by some feat of strength, Ordak had remained holding the same mast he had started holding upon finding out they were flying. The two golden vessels floated above them, when suddenly one was struck by a spell of ice. Valrin pushed himself up and went to Ordak, who was just now standing. The golden ship struck the ground in the distance, sending up an electrifying blast of blue lightning as the other ship that had been flying with it quickly ascended as more bolts of energy arched upward. Bry! Valrin shouted, running to her body lying on the edge of a broken structure. She opened her eyes as he approached. She grabbed her head and coughed. She was covered in ash that was thick on the ground. Evern was up, and he went for his staff that was a few paces from him. Defend yourselves, Evern yelled. Valrin looked to where Evern was and saw several robed figures approaching with spells in their hands. Rusus, Ordak shouted. We mean no harm. Evern began, but he was cut short by several blasts of energy that came at them in volleys. The Shadow Elf blocked many of the attacks as Valrin pulled Bry behind wreckage and Ordak fell behind Evern's ward. Another volley of spells struck around them. Bry forced herself up, still not steady but working to craft a ward with Evern as they were forced into a small alcove of wreckage. Valrin looked up at the burning city around them. The structures were taller than any he had seen. Broken crystals sat atop spires that on a different day would have been quite beautiful. A Rusus ran around the edge of the wreckage with spells summoning, but Ordak leaped for him, striking his skull with an axe. Blood sprayed with the sound of cracking bone. A fireball just missed the half-orc, and Evern stepped out, sending a blast of orange earth magic, striking one of the Rusis, evident from the sudden scream. Several Rusis sprinted in a half-moon pattern, taking up positions to flank them. It was then a blast of energy struck the center ground between the crew and the Rusis. In the explosion of white arcane dust spraying into the air, they saw two silver blades glowing. Volleys of spells converged on this one figure, who in an instant was high above them and then within them within a flash. The Rusis screamed as the blade sung through their flesh, sending a symphony of sanguine notes as the wielder almost danced through his foes, the sonnet continuing until none remained standing, and the figure alone approached. Avorn kept his sword out, as none knew who to expect. It was Riakar. Evern summoned his powers, when the Dwemhar bowed and slammed his sword into the ground before them, kneeling. Wait! Crew of the ship commanded by Valrin, much has happened, much has changed. Allow me to introduce myself again. While it was clear he had been the enemy before, he had just saved them. Instead of a long discussion, he motioned for them to follow him. We need to get back to Dwemhar-controlled regions. We attempted to guide you in. Iliu said your ship would lose power. He is alive? Valrin asked. Oh yes, one of the chief architects. A friend of mine has worked closely with him, but everything has been thrown asunder as of late. Ryakar sprinted ahead of them, leaping up into the sky. Volleys of spells screamed toward his body, and he landed amidst his enemies, once again striking down several of them before Valrin and the others even saw what was going on. Another volley of spells struck near him, and the Dwemhar slammed his blades into the balls of fire, splitting the spells apart and redirecting the energy toward his attackers. Come on! Come now! Ryakar reached out, 
his own gauntlets glowing white and sending a seismic blast that shattered several of the buildings. They had come to a bridgeway that spanned an open section of the city. Valrin and Bry ran across as Riakar floated along the railings, shielding them from several blasts that streaked through the sky. Fogs rolled over the edge of the bridge. Looking back the way they had come, Valrin saw several Rusis summoning magic around their robed forms. These Rusis looked slightly different and seemed to be wearing black armor. They came to a gateway. Riakar blew a small hand whistle and dropped into a protective stance between them and the volleys of spells that the Rusis were drawing around them. This was the longest summoning that Valrin had ever seen Rusis perform, though admittedly, these were more studied ruses than both Bry or Avium. A strange melody filled the air, and from the causeway came one of the golden ships. The ruses released their spell, but the ships used its own energies, deflecting the magic and then engaging the ruses. The gateway opened behind them, and Valrin hurried inside with the others. Riakar signaled to several figures in white robes and then reached out to a lever atop a stone pedestal. The lever was a crystal lever much like his own ship. The figures in white approached. Riakar, did they all survive? Riakar looked them over. Yes, for now. Heal them of any injuries and send all Akan to protect the Ayala Sunrise. We need to get their ship to Iliu. I do not understand. Valrin said. We should have been taken to our own time, not here. Elau never finished what he needed to. He has set forth a plan to assist you. Once we determined he was right, he told us that what mattered was being ready, at least from his point of view. You tried to kill us, Ordak said. I know. Riakar nodded. Much has changed. All that was of Eliaka was destroyed. Destroyed? The Conclave tried to force Elu's machinery with their own powers, and there was an explosion. Terexo survived, but only so long. Because they were attempting to mess with what they did not understand, they had poisoned so many of our kin within the city. Some see the explosion as a blessing. It seems it worked out in a sad way. I am one of the few who know of you and where you are from. Our Akan will work to get your ship to the city center. Too bad you could not have come within the last moon. Ayaklo was a different place then. What are these Akan you speak of? Ordak asked. Flying vessels. Most are automated. They patrol above the city, watching for our enemy. Others, like the ones that flew beside you as you came into the realm, are piloted by some of the few remaining Dwemhar within the city. And your enemy is the Rusis? They are of the Golden Templar, Purists Rusis. They came into the city after the destruction of one of their temples. Valrin glanced around as Bry was tended to by the healers. So this is Iclo? As it is for us, but not as it is for you, I understand. Iclo is a land of its own, an island. Mysterious, Riakar said. We are not an island, more like a cloud that passes over the mountains. We are flying, Ordak asked. Why, yes. Why do you think you see so many clouds around you? Ordak snapped to look behind him and then ran around in a circle. We are in the sky. The half-orc ran atop one of the buildings. Evorn, I can't see anything except clouds. Tell me this is not where we are. Oh, come down, Ordak. He shook his head and looked to Valrin. A most stalwart warrior, but he doesn't take to flying. We rode dragons once. Evorn laughed. Back then I had an herb to quiet the oaf of an orc. Valrin, we are flying. Yes, I know, he told him. As the orc continued his anxious dance between edges in the protective walls, several Akan floated over top the fortress of rock and continued across the bridge. There were blasts of fire and rubble shattering beneath the strange melody-like sound of the machines. Does it really sound like music? Bry asked. A strange question, but the vibrations of the crystals within the vessels give out a melodic ringing. Most of our other defenses are constructs, 
Thankfully, the city was abandoned for our tasks. There are many ancient Dwemhar within the confines of the city itself, some that had even been entombed to be reborn in a time after our war. Tasks? Valren asked. Riakar stood staring at them, but then looked to one of the healers. I go to the inner city with the crew. The Akan will deliver the ship to Eliu, and then come back to support the bridge defense. Stay down, but in the event the fortress is broken, fall back into the inner sanctum fortifications. They're moving toward the primary crystals in the interior. We have to hold them until we are to our destination. He turned to the Valrin. Come, the journey to the city center is not the quaint walk it was once. Valrin and the others followed the Dwemhar as he descended a stairwell to their left and took them through a passageway that looked out over the lower city and fires beneath them. Valrin himself was staring at Riakar with a focused gaze. He can say as much we can say of the future, Bry told him. What? You look like you're trying to cast a spell into the back of his head. He is a warrior of old, a hero of the Dwemhar as I understand it. He knows of us, and Iliu has no doubt taken precautions regarding the bending of time that we've already done. It isn't our place to know what they are doing. Evorn sighed. Our Rusis is correct. At that moment, Riakar looked back as they continued down the passage. Aside from the confines of this passage and the echoes of your voices, I can literally read your minds, and I assure you that the need of Ayeklo and our purpose just happens to coincide with these events and the need to repair your ship and make necessary adjustments. You were called to this time by Elayu himself. Though that was not the intention of our task, we have used this to our advantage, for even though our people as a whole would be accepting of you, it is easier in the grand scheme of time and the flow of such things that we not have to answer the questions that would inherently arise from your discovery by our people. His answer was annoying to Valrin as before Riakar had spoken, but he assumed he just had to deal with the mystery surrounding their current state and the state of a place he knew as an island in his time. They had reached the outside again. This time, they were on a much lower level and a series of stone walkways that seemed to follow the outer edge of several tall crystalline buildings. The buildings shimmered in the sunlight to their left, and with each moment of progress up and down several steps and through passageways, where hanging vines and red flowers recently singed by fires in one of the many districts of Iclo, the sun itself was disappearing from view. Large glowing stones dotted the now much larger passageway. They were heading into the city now. The dark windows and sealed passageway showed signs of battle in the days, weeks, and months before now. They came to a shattered fountain and a lone figure standing with a long spear at his side. Riakar, I received word. Riakar embraced this man. Your Akan is safe? Took some hits on the road up ahead, but I nearly took out the causeway. I've sent it to protect the lower city. This man looked behind Riakar. These are the ones? Yes, Riakar said. Indeed. The man bowed. I am friend to Riakar. He paused. Can I tell them my name? Let us not. We'll let Iliu do what is needed. The man bowed. Time travel is an oddity to be sure. Just know I am on your side as it is. This other Dwemar stood silently behind them. Okay, Riakar said. Now that I know our enemy is this way, we will make certain to be on guard. My friend will watch our flanks. Avern, Bry, keep wards up in the event of an attack. Valrin and Ordak, guard yourselves, but do not go out of the way to fight. Eliu said you killing some of these Rusis could have weird effects in your time, allegedly. I do not know. My studies are of the blade and the mind. I know little of clocks as it is. Riakar said nothing else. Proceeding ahead, Valrin and the others rushed to follow the Dwemhar warrior as they passed between two towering spires with floating crystals above their pinnacles. The crystals were blue in color, with occasional bolts of red lightning dancing between them. 
The road they were on spanned a great opening between two sections of the city, where the darkening sky was red beneath them, and stars shone in the open expanse above. Rhea Carr drew his blades. They were entering a broken-down gateway in the middle of the walkway, and though Valrin and the others were staying on the road, Rhea Carr leaped from where they were to the edge of the upper tower. Immediately, blasts of fire engulfed where he stood, but he was high in the air above them. He spun in place, bringing his blades in a fanning motion beneath him, sending slivers of white fire all over the top of the tower itself. Valrin drew his blade as he and Ordak pushed through the opening. Bolts of ice struck around them, and they fell against a broken column. Evorn and Brae cast their wards, and the other Dwemhar ran alongside them. Do not pause. We must go. He spoke to them in their minds. The warrior used his weapon to swipe rocks ahead of them to either side and made the opening that was big enough before for them to squeeze through much larger. Ivorn went first, keeping his ward up as several blasts of fire struck one side of them. Valrin and Ordak ran ahead, with Bry sprinting to get ahead of them. Three more blasts came their way, and Bry's ward shattered. She sent a bouncing bolt of lightning toward where the other spells were coming from. Rusis, come to us! They use mind control! One of the enemy Rusis shouted. A horn call went out, but was cut short as Riakar landed amidst the Rusis. His blade slashed across their chests over and over, sending chunks of bloody tissue and bone in great swaths. Move! he shouted. Valrin and the others obeyed, running past the still-dying forms collapsed and bleeding all over the stone works. From the edges of the bridges, more of the Gold Templar emerged. They are like demons climbing from the depths, the unnamed Dwemhar shouted. The man used his weapon point first onto the ground, thrusting it into the brick and flying high above them before slamming down again and throwing back those just coming over the void of the walkway. In Valrin's opinion, the two warriors made their journey seem easy. The Golden Templar, these warriors within the burning ruins of Iaclo, were no match for these two. But then, he questioned why Iaclo was in the state it was. Have Rhea Carr and his companion held out by themselves on Iaclo? Were there more like them, or have they all fallen? It didn't matter, and as they came to the end of the bridge, they passed through several opening gateways that quickly shut behind them automatically. They had come to another district of Iaclo, and Valrin's questions were partially answered. There were many Dwemhar here. They were lying in the narrow packed streets around the gateway. These were not as those they had seen in Iliaka. These Dwemhar had adornments on their heads, but their clothing was tattered. There were many small children, and though they did not seem injured, there was a stark fear in their eyes as Riakar walked beside them. A young girl ran up to him. Are they coming in, Master Riakar? Valrin could not believe what he saw. At first, he didn't recognize the pointed ears or the fact that this clearly wasn't a Dwemhar. Riakar knelt. Not as long as I hold my blades. You are safe, child. Another child took that moment to run up and punch him in the arm. This one, a young boy, was also an elf. I am writing a book of you. You'll be known forever to the elves. I will be sure of it. Riakar laughed. Thank you, young one. I would like to read it when you are done. But for now, I have important business. I must continue on. He set the child down and then walked quickly ahead of them. Elves in Eclo? Valrin asked. Survivors, dear Stormborn. Mostly orphans. Even the Dwemar make mistakes. Valrin wondered what he meant by this, but he knew better than to ask. They were going deep into the city again, but at this point, Valrin noticed what appeared to be mountains. He even spotted a glowing cave in the far distance. Our forge! A place of wondrous machinery! The unnamed Dwemhar said. Oh, that place! Ordak laughed. It was far from them, but the fact they were now seeing the mine and the forge they had been to on Iaclo in their time was wondrous, but caused a sickening feeling of dread. They were approaching a tower with many floating crystals moving around it. 
Though most of this region of the city was not smoking or showed much damage at all, the air itself was strange here. As they approached the tower itself, several large constructs moved before them, emerging from the stone itself and taking the form of large spiders with red eyes. Valrin had never seen such things, their metallic clinking as they repositioned themselves, revealing a doorway just beyond them. The secrets within the central control tower are not beyond risk of discovery, but we have taken many precautions. As they passed the spiders and entered the structure, Valrin looked up at spinning crystals and a large silver disk high above them. Lightning rolled off the disk and onto pools that went down through the center of the structure. Two stairwells went up from the doorway to a central platform and a figure in gold armor. As Valrin reached the top of the stairwell, the figure turned and bowed. It was Eliu. Behind him were many different stones and even imagery akin to his own map aboard the Ayla Sunrise. Welcome, Valrin, to Ayiklo, the pinnacle of my knowledge and the meaning to all of what I have done and not done in this life. As the rest of the crew, as well as the unnamed Dwemhar and Ryakar, gathered around, Eliu looked up at the Dwemhar. Ryakar, Nidra, you've done well to get them here. Now I wasn't sure I could reveal my name, Nidra said. You told us we could not tell them anything beyond what they know. Such things are not important. I have seen much of our future. Trust that I know of what is fine and what is not. Of course, Nidra said. You built Ayaklo and it was a flying vessel. Is, at least for me. For now, we've taken considerable damage. Our pests have damaged many of my crystals, and the city falters. But now, he said, putting his arm around Valrin, I continue along my path to attempt to help my people. Though I am not as I was before, my brushing with you in my younger life was but a hint of what was to come, not a clear picture. I have worked to secure Ayaklo as a place for my people. We Dwemar have many forms in this new world already, and our war continues. Your city burns, Ordak said. There is not much for its people now. The business of Ayaklo is not of concern to you of the Ayla Sunrise. Our actions are our own. Your ship has been brought to my workshop, and many within it already work to restore it. I have found the automated turtles within the ship and reinvigorated their life sources. You had used a power source that was not familiar to them, though it was of Dwemhar origin. I have restored them. I've also given them the knowledge of basic defense and the ability to engage your ship's ward if needed. I believe you may find use of that in the future. Valrin had wondered why his small constructs had not emerged since well before now when they were facing the Barb King. This explained it. So, he continued, even without the blueprints, we have restored most of your ship and I work to finalize the weapon system to disable this city in your time. Now I am working to calibrate it. Well, I have it set up to calibrate. It will be ready in time. In time? Valrin asked. In time for you to leave, Ryakar said. We are on our own important mission. The city is mostly emptied. Just a few Rusis remain, and they will be dealt with. A rumbling shook the structure. Eliu looked to Ryakar. Nothing was said between them, but that wasn't necessary for Dwemhar. Ryakar bowed and began to run away. Eliu went to a large table with many crystals floating above the stone. He moved them about, bringing up a projection of what appeared to be the city. He then shook his head as several parts went dark. I will finish my work on the ship, he said. He flipped a stone beneath the table and brought up a map just as the Ayla Sunrise had. The city was floating toward a single large mountain. Valrin noticed they were somewhere over what looked like the mountains of Taria. Where do you go? Evern asked. To end our war. A sudden blast of fire tore through the center of the room. Evern and Bry both cast their wards as Ordak drew his blades. Eliue lifted a small golden staff and motioned toward several figures holding flames. 
Several balls of fire flew toward them, and the Rusis vanished. They are using invisibility, Bry shouted. From the other direction came more Rusis this time, through an opening in the upper ceiling. The air sizzled and cracked with bolts of lightning dancing around the room. Bry and Valrin tucked away, moving toward a lower level as several blasts of fire struck near them. There came another shuddering thunder, and part of the structure collapsed on the path they could take back up. There was still another way to the room they were in, but it was engulfed in flames. Valrin noticed a door. He reached out to it, and it opened. This way! Asterisk, 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 asterisk. He didn't know where he was taking them, but he did so anyway. They were headed lower into the city, and the fighting taking place where they were before was still going on. He hoped they could find a way back to the upper region, but if this place was anything like the area he had dealt with in the Ayaklo of their time, he expected that it would take some time to get back where they were. Rusis are attacking this city all over. It was quite risky for them to do something like this. The Rusis and Dwemar did nothing but kill each other, it seems, Valrin said, though I wonder what Iliu plans to do to end the war. I guess the Rusis don't know it all themselves, Bry said, now looking around at the many large crystals adorning the walls. If the Dwemhar seek to end the war, then the Rusis should stop fighting. We would like to, a voice said. In a sudden flash of light appeared Rungar. He had several other Rusis trailing behind him. Master, you reveal us, one of them said. I do not. This man is not Dwemhar, and this woman is of our race. He motioned them forward. Go, secure our path. There is nothing that way, Valrin said. The way is blocked. Not blocked for those who have been here before. If the lower stairwell is blocked, that is ideal. We have made a passage in the walls once here, several moons ago, before this place began its work. Ayaklo? So... That is its name? Yes, a city of the Dwemhar. City, he laughed with a harsh tone. They call this a city? Perhaps in one time it was to be a refuge, a place of ascension even as they claim to us. But it is not a city like I have seen. We did all we could to disable this place before it launched. The high Dwemhar protected every mountain pass. If you could have seen it from the ground, you would have understood our terror. The entire length of the city stretched over mountains. On the outer edges of the city were massive thunderstorms, so from the ground beneath, all you saw were the clicking gears underneath it. We had taken Iliaka, but most of the Dwemhar were destroyed. Riakar told us of an accident, Valrin said. Indeed, he was not even there when it happened. The void was opened. Demons took one of their places of powers in the Far East, and he had been sent to intervene. Therefore, you do not meddle in things you should not meddle in, no matter what source of power you believe you are able to obtain. When at last he had fixed what his people had started, the explosion shook the world. It was we Rusis who found that Eliaka was abandoned. Furthermore, this Ayaklo, as you call it, was hidden well. I was in another city when the battle that failed to stop the city from leaving the ground was enacted. Over ten thousand Rusis died in a single day. The Rusis stopped, rubbing his head, and then looked at them both, placing his hands on their shoulders. They had told me to rest, to recover. But I left my city to get to those who had been left on the desolate fields beneath Ayeklo. It was then I saw the flash from the high clouds and watched as my city was engulfed in flame. Ayaklo destroyed it. My people have not stopped yet. We found a place where our kin were being held, being placed into these flying machines as a source of power. Most were near death, but in a sacrifice, we attempted our first attack. I and over a hundred of my brothers and sisters dropped into this place and attempted to wrestle this place from their control. We made it to the control room once. That is where we go again. We have little time. From the ground you cannot even see this place, but we have been fighting since it was still east of the Tykan Range. The Tykan Range? Then it is above Taria, 
Valrin said. But the Dwemhar seek to end the war. Eliu and Riakar say they wish for peace. Riakar might, but he does not know what this place can do. Or maybe he does. We must stop them, Valrin. One of the Rusis came back to where the rest of them were. Master, the way forward is blocked. We will need to go back, take the center stairwell up into the tower, and ascend there. Rungar shook his head. Damn, that takes us past the machine they have there. It watches that way. We've lost too many attempting to best it. It can sense us. If I can get to it, is there a way I can disable it? If you will not actually try to kill the Dwemhar, that is. You said you wanted peace. We have few left, one of the Rusi said. Master, if this boy leads us to capture or worse, delays us getting to them and stopping this, Rinagres will fall. They move toward Rinagres? Bry asked. A sister city, a place across a wide lake from our holy city. But if any more cities fall to this cursed weapon, then our fate shall be the same as our people. We will not give up while yet Arusis still lives. We desire peace beyond everything, but we will protect our people, Rungar said with a bow. He looked to the other Ruses and then back to Valrin. If you can get to the machine and remove the crystal in its back, it will lose power, but you'll have to overpower the magic protecting its back. We defeated one several days ago, but once they sense your life force, the entire system knows you. The system doesn't know me, Bry said. I can help him. Rusis of the future, Rungar said. You bring honor to your race. Tell me, is Rena Grace well in your world? Bry looked to Valrin, but did not immediately respond. I see, he said. Bry bowed to Rungar. It isn't that. I am not to speak of the future to those of the past, but I will do what I can to bring peace. She smiled, which he did in return. Come. This way, he said. I will show you the way I speak of. Though the hallway they were presently standing in was large and dark, Rungar led them back out of a large door to an even larger corridor with high ceilings and massive crystal domes that had been shattered. The passage went up into the city but was covered in wreckage and the bodies of Dwemar scattered and broken around. Forward! Rungar shouted in a hushed voice. The group of Rusis spread out in the wreckage and began moving through the shadows as if preparing the way they were going and assuring that Rungar, Valrin, and Bry were kept safe. This way is barely watched. The ill energies from the many dead keep even the Dwemhar who remain from coming this way. There are not many remaining, Valrin said. Riakar and one other warrior. There are many civilians and those who work on my ship, but it seems both of you are losing numbers you cannot afford to lose. They came to an area where the wind whistled through an open doorway to the right and out one to their left. The red sky was visible to their left side. The Rusi stacked up against the door, and Rungar did the same. He leaned out and pointed, motioning for Valrin to look. Valrin saw a large golden metal object in the center of many wrecked buildings. Do you see the golden construct? Yes. Bry, Rungar said. Can you blend with the shadows? I can, she said, but only for a short time. What kind of rusis? Another of Rungar's followers spoke. Silence, he snapped to his follower. You have trained under the masters, but she has had no one. Do not speak ill of one who may save all you love. Rungar turned to Bry. Go on. Move toward the rear of the construct once Valrin has its attention. But assure you have focus on your spell now. Bry closed her eyes and felt herself falling away from the sight of the world. Valrin watched as she faded into a shimmering veil and then vanished completely. Quite a rusis you have with you. Rungar said. Her ability is strong, and I have seen many students with more training than I know she has fail at that. Consider yourself fortunate to have such a companion. He laughed. Now for you, you must keep this construct's attention. 
It will not attack one of your blood, no matter how small your Dwemhar bloodline is. You are of the race of men, and as such, it should not attack you. Should not? Valrin asked, emphasizing the should. Rungar winked. It is time. Rungar pushed him out, and as he looked back, he felt Bry's hand on his back. Let's go, she said. Valrin looked around at the open ground around him. There were many blackened and broken buildings and shattered crystal all over the ground. What remained of a fountain and broken pieces of roads were upturned and in disarray. The golden construct seemed to notice him, flashing gold before standing up on three legs. Valrin drew his sword. The center of the construct spun many times on circular tracks, growing in height before a large white crystal emerged from the top of it. Creature, it said in a voice like ringing metal, you are not of the ones who bring destruction. Valrin did not know if he should speak to the construct. He noticed the machine was whirring as it seemingly stared at him. He went to walk to the right, and it stood higher, one of its legs moving in the same direction. Speak, answer, that is what is expected. I will say again, you are not of the ones who bring destruction. No, Valrin said, looking back to the door where the Rusis were. Then you are not to be harmed by Dwemar Law, Holy of the Holies, White Scroll of Acts, as deemed appropriate by automaton spells. I can assist you, child of Dwemhar. What do you seek? Most of the city is broken, failed, my directorate. I wish to preserve. Who started the war between Rusis and Dwemhar? War, a miscreation of civilization. War between Rusis and Dwemhar began due to failure to see as both saw. How do I explain? Strife, jealousy, power. All war is of power. Yes, preservation is the reason given for war. Preservations to be made by preserver. Are you a preserver? I am under order by Master of Time. I operate as deemed acceptable. I preserve, as you say. The Master of Time? The Clockmaster? I am a construct of gears and energy directed by time. Master of Time created. Master of Time, the original source of what you call war. Light flashed behind the construct, and a shattering sound came before shards of metal and stone shot up around them. The creature stood up. Two large horns of gold came to life with whirring spells of fire before it spun in place. Child of Dwemar, hide! I will protect you! The construct spun about, spraying fire, but only until its back was visible to the doorway. Rungar and the others sprinted out, sending a furious flurry of their own spells. Valrin went to run, moving for where he saw Bry when the construct moved over him again. I will protect you. Another round of blasts struck the construct, and it exploded in white flames, crumpling into itself. Valrin was thrown from the blast, landing just a few paces from where Bry was. As Rungar and the others joined Bry near Valrin, Bry pulled him up. Our way is clear now, Rungar said. It was then the ground rumbled behind them as dust flew in a plume around two figures. The Rusi summoned their spells, but Rungar lifted his hand. Hold! In the dust appeared Riakar with his brother. The two Dwemar warriors had weapons ready, but did not attack. Valrin, Riakar said, blinking in surprise. These Rusis treat you well? Yes, he told him. You are not a prisoner. You are not bound as such. No, they helped us. They seek peace. Riakar looked at Rungar. Peace? Rungar stepped forward, bowing deeply to the Dwemhar. Brother, once I called you that. Once we stood together against the Void Demons. Now a new evil, one of division, threatens us all. We are two races of the original four, yet we destroy one another. May we be the ones who stop this bloodshed. The Dwemhar do what is against their own code. Where before your path was one to ascension, now we have fallen beneath that of, it would seem, the race of men. We fight for power, yet leave destruction in our wake. 
Tell me you have not fallen so much to see this as the path forward for our races? Ryakar stared at his blades for a moment, and then looked back to Rungar. You have stood beside me many times, my once brother. These blades forged in my home were secured to defend all races against the power of the void. In that time my fight was simple, yet I have been torn as a preserver of life in my actions. We do not seek to destroy you, Rungar. We go toward Renegrays to offer peace, to give this city to you. What lies does he spew? Arusis behind them shouted. Rungar raised his hand in silence. This city we are within does not bring peace but destruction. Surely you are not blind to what it has already done. Riyakar stared at Rungar, focusing, his hands trembling. He slowly sheathed both of his blades and rubbed his right hand. Valrin noticed a gold ring that he twisted with his finger. I... I cannot remember. My mind has been so weary. I... I truly do not know. Aiklo is a weapon of destruction, created with the guise of a supposed salvation, Rungar said. Do you think the Ruses would try so hard to destroy a simple vessel of safety? What bewitches you? You are not the Dwemhar I know. It is the ring, Valrin said, much to the surprise of both. The ring, it controls you. Not so much the ring, but the one who placed it on you. In my time, there was a forge within Ayaklo, and their rings were crafted that could control anyone. It is mixed with your blood in order to match the power of the one meant to contain. Even you, Rungar, fell to this magic. Ryakar immediately pulled at the gold ban on his hand, but was unable to remove it. There is a rod, a staff, something that... He paused. Valrin thought back to the clockmaster. Eliu, he said. Eliu's staff. He is using it to control you, to protect him. Riyakar's face became cross, and he pulled again at the ring. I served the Dwemhar freely. I have given much for our people. Why would anyone feel I had to be forced to act? To assure your allegiance, Rungar said. The Ruses embraced the Dwemhar. Let us free you of this. Take us to Iliu. We will confront him with all present to bear witness. Let us stop this bloodshed before it continues. He will not like this, his brother said. He will answer for this, be it by force or by free admission. I will not be a puppet to anyone, and he will free me from this bond. At this point, Valrin and Bry walked with the others as Riakar led them into the central tower and threw a shimmer veil that he lowered to allow all of them into the inner tower. They ascended several steps and then came to a passage that led into a much larger area. There were several dead Rusis lying on the ground on the other side of the door. Valrin could see the glowing core of the city rising through this section. Riakar turned to them. I take Valrin and Bry in first. The rest of you wait. Valrin, tell your crew not to attack the Rusis. I will confront Iliu, and we will see what happens. My mind is not what it was, but I believe I remember something that may force him to speak of the truth of this city. High elves and fire. A dream I have had. I see them all dying in a sudden fireball from the sky, but I could not understand it. I saw that it was the Rusus who did it, but now I feel I may be remembering something my mind has been forced to forget. He paused. This path is so far from that of the Dwemhar, I do not know the way back. We await your signal, brother, the Master Rusus said. As Riyakar emerged with Valrin and Bry, he looked up the stairwell. Valrin noticed Ordak first, and then Evern. Captain! Ordak shouted. Evorn emerged on the stairs and nodded in approval. I was worried of your fate, young one, but it seems you have taken care of one another yet again. Come, he has completed the ship. We can depart soon. Riyakar pushed past Evorn as Valrin began to explain the events that had taken place. They went up to the level where Eliwe was to find Riyakar standing with his hands together in front of his chest. Is there something you wish to say, Riyakar? Have you hunted down the intruders? 
Is the city safe? What is this? Riakar asked, holding up his hand with the ring on it. Elihu paused for a moment, focusing now on Valrin. Captain, your ship is ready. I deem you go to it at once. You will find you have what is needed. I work to assure all is as it should be. Do not speak to them if you cannot even address one of your own kin, Ryakar shouted. You shout? That is not the path of a Dwemhar. You need rest. Ryakar drew one of his blades and angled it at Iliwe. Threaten me? Why, I have not wronged you. Ryakar pushed his hand up toward Iliu. What is this magic? Assurance of loyalty. No matter what transpired. I serve all by my honor. I need not be coerced or bewitched. We protect our people, yet even with that knowledge, I feel doubt in my own mind of the events. Nidra approached now, lifting his own hand. I too have this ring. Riakar drew his second blade. Answer for this. What is the purpose of such devices? We cannot take them off. I have spoken to Rungar, and he tells me this is a vessel of death. You do not wish peace. Elu's hand went for the staff lying on a nearby altar, but Nidra lunged, grasping it first. Iliu's face shifted from confidence to annoyance. He sighed. I know much of the future and the past. Seeing the vessel of the sea people, the Aela Sunrise, tells me our people split down two paths. A world where Ruses survive in any form when the Dwemhar fall was not one I would allow. He turned to Valrin and then looked to Riakar. I will admit that the city of the elves was destroyed by Ayaklo. I have a weapon of similar device to the Akan vessels that is powered by the same crystals that keep us aloft. I knew from talking to the Stormborn that I could undo my past transgressions if I just had time. Ayaklo, at one time, was not as it is now, but the fact was that it had failed even in our own history. Riakar, Nidra, the Rusis would do the same to us. Our path to ascension was lost, and our people faced destruction. The Rusis wish peace. A path as that is surely worth meditation on, at least, Riakar stated. Do we not feel a darker evil growing in the shadows of the world? I have felt it, Nidra has. Do we not work toward a second ascension? How does purity of soul tie into the destruction of a race? Suddenly, appearing beside Riakar, the master Rusis Rungar appeared. Peace be with you, Dwemhar, he said bowing to Iliu. My once brother speaks the truth. I only wish to secure peace and end the threat to my people. Valrin looked down the stairwell, seeing many more Rusis preparing themselves on the lower level. He nudged Evern. The ship, we need to get to it. Evern nodded slowly. He whistled to Ordak and motioned for him to move to the other side of the room. Here there was a long hallway, and as the crew reached this side, Valrin saw his ship awaiting them. So it has come to this. I create a way to ensure our safety and my own kin come against me. Ironic. The Dwemhar begged for my assistance, and I was captured, forced to complete what I did not want. And in some point in this, I am suddenly the aggressor? Tell me of the High Elves, the destruction of their city. You said it was a Rusus blast that decimated their woods, and their army was led into a storm of mage fire, while Iclo absorbed magic from beneath the elven woods. We saved many that day. The elves would not attack the Ruses otherwise, Iliu said. In time, they will be given a realm of their own. The Ruses have not been at war with the elves, Rungar said. The destruction of the woods of the north was one even the Ruses did not understand. Iliu was silent. This machine you have created is nothing but a weapon of terror. Uh... Iliu cut off Riakar. This is our only hope, but as I try to right the future and assist the Stormborn, I have continued to serve our people. The elves were but pawns who would not play the game. You do not know of those who will come from these elves. One day, these elves will be given a place called Urlas 
and from the ashes of the old will come those who unite our race. Why do you question when you know I am a master of time and realms? Because you force all around you against their will. You have destroyed an entire culture of elves. That is not our purpose as decreed by the great poet. The Dwemhar, the elves, the dwarves, and the Rusis were to guard these lands and seas in the name of the gods. I did not fight and bleed protecting our eastern temples from the monsters that emerged from the void for you to sacrifice all that our people stand for. Riakar's power began to ripple his hair, and Nidra drew his own weapon, still holding Elio's staff. Nidra, you think that is my only way? Eliu closed his eyes and then opened them again with a flash of white. Riakar and Nidra immediately shifted, angling their weapons toward Rungar. Rusis, you will not stop me! I have taken all precautions to ensure my end for your people! Eliu shouted. Templar! Rungar shouted. Valrin turned away, running with his crew toward the Aela sunrise, as blasts of fire and lightning and clanging blades filled the air behind them. There were many white-robed attendants who fell away from the ship even as the entire structure began to shake around them. The Aela sunrise was docked on a platform that was open to a cloudy expanse. Beneath them, Valrin could see little, but as he went to the helm of his ship, he noticed that a massive device almost like a crossbow without a string lay on the deck. Return to your time, and do not hate me for what I do. Know that destruction befell these cities regardless of Iaclo, but I work toward a greater purpose. All will make sense in time, for time is all I can ensure. Valrin was in a slight daze as Eliu spoke to him. Go! Ordak shouted. We need to go! Valrin shifted the levers at the helm, and the sails of the Aela Sunrise were engorged in white flames before the ship lunged forward. He kept his focus, descending as he felt himself even more attuned with his ship. Explosions rocked the city above him, and what sounded like thunder sent shockwaves across the deck. I wonder what happens above us, Bry asked. I do not know, but it is nothing we can have a hand in, Evern said. As they descended into the clouds, Valrin noticed the device that was first affixed to their deck by the clockmaster seemed to be building up energy. I pray we return to our time this time, Bry said. As they broke through the clouds, they saw a wide ocean beneath them and mountains ahead. It was then Valrin noticed a glowing orb on the ground far beneath them. The device to take them from this time seemed to be ready and was glowing brightly. What do you wait for, Stormborn? Evern asked. Valrin wheeled right and focused. The ship descended further, and as he came closer to the orb, he noticed it was no mere magic protecting a single person, but an entire city. There was another city across the water. It, too, was glowing with a bright orb around it. That is Renegress, Bry said, the city of my people. And this is the city that is its sister, Ordak said. Evern went to Valrin. Stormborn, we must go. Valrin steadied the ship, floating high above the ocean and looking out at the Rusi city. It was dark, and the glow of the massive orb protecting the city undulated with blue flames, shimmering on the ocean beneath them. Valrin looked up, and it was like there were stars glowing brighter in the sky above, but it was not stars, but the city Iaclo and the terrible weapon created by Eliu. The Rusis had failed to stop Eliu. A crystal suddenly appeared above the Rusis city. At first it was stationary, and then it began to move in a pattern over the high points of the ward, breaking off small shards at different points until the one crystal was like many uncountable pieces floating together with ripples of energy linking each of them and flowing up toward Iaclo. It is time for us to flee, Evern said. You cannot stop this, and you should not. Ielko was not a weapon before this. Iliu did this because he knew the future. He manipulates time, Bry said. No matter our acts, he can change or adjust as he wishes. No, Valrin said. 
He may manipulate time, but we are not here by accident. He said it was because of us that he created such a weapon. Perhaps the events that have transpired are similar to what already came to pass in our world. Urlas is a realm, so the destruction of the elves did happen at some point. I do not know much, but I will not stand by and watch an entire city be destroyed when I have possibly encouraged such an act. I am Stormborn, and it is my task to protect the sea and the path of ascension, not to intervene like this, Evern said. The darkness turned to day, and from beneath Iaclo, a blast of energy tore through the clouds and engulfed the Rus's city in a deafening explosion that shot up, shifting the stability of the Aela sunrise. Valrin guided the ship away from the growing fireball beneath them, even as a wave of heat struck them. The Aela sunrise ascended, and the burning sensation ceased. Valrin heard the clicking of the gears beneath Iaclo as it shifted across the skies. In the wake of the blast was nothing but broken crystals and fire on the ground beneath them. The ocean rolled into the crater that remained of the city that just before had hundreds if not thousands of Rusis. Evern, Ordok, and Bry looked over the edge of the deck as they ascended higher. Prayers to the gods, Ordok said, and I don't even like them. Bry turned and sat with her back against the railings. Tears rolled down her face. Valrin looked up at Ayeklo, unsure of the fates of Riakar or Rungar. He did not know how much their actions so far had affected the world. Now looking at Bry, he suddenly felt himself again on Trava, alone, not knowing his origins or who he was. He thought of how the ruses he had come to, maybe even love, was broken seeing the destruction of so many of her people at once. No, he whispered. He reached down, adjusting the levers at the helm and sending energies to his weapons. What are you doing, Stormborn? Eliu's voice was in his head, but he did not care. He angled the ship. Brace yourselves, he yelled to the crew. As he watched each of them grab the railings, he shifted the angle further and felt himself flying upward as the right side of the ship was parallel with the underside of Iclo. He sent volleys of white orbs spiraling toward the crystals beneath the city of Iclo, shattering the exposed underside of the city in a dazzling blast of energy. Iclo began to waver in its flight, drifting away from Renegris and floating toward the north. Valrin reached down and engaged the time-traveling device, and they left the past. In a sudden explosion of water, they emerged again with the shores of Iaclo before them and the massive ship they had faced before they had met the Clockmaster in the distance. Part 6. Twilight Time Valrin jerked to look around them. Evern stared at the sky and the stars. We are back in our own time, Stormborn. But why did you do that to Iclo? It matters not, Ordak said. The city is still as it was when we were here before, yet we are not where we were. The ship of Marog was in the distance, but its sails were down. They were looking at a portion of the island they had not seen before. In the moonlight, it appeared that there were tall and massive trees, but like most things on Ayeklo, they were dead. In the distance beyond the skeletal trees, Valrin could see Avium, or where he assumed Avium was in the form of a glowing area of magic held high above the actual island itself. Iclo was still hovering just above the surface of the ocean, and for now the swirling darkness of the Scourge Siren focused itself around Avium. Valrin and the crew had not been noticed yet by either of their foes. We have the weapon, Ordak said. Now we need to disable Iaclo and get to shore. That ship will not simply ignore us, Evern said. Valrin nodded and stepped down from the helm, looking at the strange weapon Eliu had added to the ship. There was a seat of sorts and two crystals on either side of handles affixed to the body of the weapon. Valrin looked at the others. The first step is to bring down Iaclo, and then we'll see what we must do. Perhaps this weapon will work against the other vessel? What do you think, Stormborn? 
Evern asked with an obvious annoyance to his tone. Messing with time has already been an act that I do not feel was best. I don't ask for permission, Evern. You are a faithful friend, but I acted as I saw correct. I will continue to do so, though I know we disagreed. I do still respect your opinion, of course, but I must act as I feel as needed, and sometimes it will not align with everyone's thoughts. Evern bowed. Indeed, Valrin, but we must all admit that we toy with careful circumstances. I am here to guide and protect you as much as possible. And I thank you, Valrin said. Though the conversation was awkward, Valrin now looked to the other two members of his crew. We move toward Ayaklo. Ordak, you take position on the weapon. Bry, he said with a smile. Protect our right side, Evorn, our left side. We strike Ayaklo and then move to catch the other vessel as it prepares to respond. If the weapon allows, we will focus it on Ayaklo, and if successful, move it toward the vessel of Marog. The crew moved into position, but in truth, Valrin did not have any idea if his plan would even work. He hoped it would but he could not be sure of any of it. The enemy ship was still dark with its sails down. As he raised his own sails, the Ayla sunrise lurched forward with a quickening pace. Ordok sat down at the weapon, and the entire piece began to glow with several crystals emerging along the main body. As he pointed the weapon off the bow of the ship, Valrin turned their course to the left to keep the island on their right. Try it, Valrin said. Trying? No, Ordak said with glee. Doing. The half-orc pressed the crystals, and the weapon surged to life with an electrifying blast, cutting across the water in a beam that rattled the entire ship. Ayaklo was unfazed, but the beam struck the rock of the island nonetheless, throwing pieces of rocks into the sky in a fiery explosion. Valrin noticed that all the crystals of his ship were engaged, sending energy into the main weapon on the deck. Should I stop? Ordak asked. Iclo does not change. The island was being torn apart, but nothing else had happened. Keep focus, Valrin said. The actual city is beneath the years of rock. I assume it must reach the structure itself. The vessel of Marog began to come to life. Torches lit up across its deck, and the sails raised. Keep targeting Ayaklo, he shouted, angling the ship to prepare to use his own weapons. Valrin moved the levers at the helm, setting it up to send a volley of energy, but the crystals along the ship would not engage while focused into the weapon. The sky suddenly flashed blue as the enemy vessel released its own weapons. Evorn and Bry cast their spells, attempting to deflect the blasts but they were ineffective. Valrin turned the ship hard right, shifting their course and throwing off Ordak's targeting. The spell struck the water near where the ship had been. Ordak focused the Dwemhar weapon toward the Marog vessel. At that moment, the shadows and fires of Iklo took form above the area where he was previously firing the device, and the scourge siren screeched. In a sudden gust of winds, both the vessels in the seas were pulled toward Ayaklo as the spirit drew up the ocean water to douse the fires that had been started to break through the island's rocky exterior. The weapon was breaking through the enemy vessel, but as the two ships were drawn together, Valrin shouted his orders. Aim for Ayaklo! Focus the weapon there! Blasts of fire struck the deck of the Ayla Sunrise, and Valrin took cover behind the wheel as Bray and Evern sent their own spells at the deck of the vessel. Dark forms moved about the ship, and though they appeared as flesh-and-blood figures of some type, they moved about the ship like phantoms, shifting from one spot to the next. Ordak struck Ayaklo again, and the scourge siren wailed. As the energy from the weapon broke through more of the rock, the area where Avium was suspended began to flicker as lightning stuck the island itself, and energies high above Ayaklo began to be disrupted. The scourge siren fled the spot where the Ayla sunrise targeted and began spinning around Avium, 
summoning up fogs of bolts of black lightning that engorged the sky in smoke. There was an explosion on the side of Iclo, and lava poured into the ocean. Both the Aela Sunrise and the other vessel were released into the ocean. Ordak kept up the assault, and another explosion overtook Iclo, dropping the entire island into the ocean with a massive and thunderous crash. Ordak ceased firing as Valrin turned the vessel, attempting to prepare to flee, but a massive wave of water was coming their way. He and the enemy vessel plowed forward, both ascending to the top of the wave and back down the other side. Valrin took that moment of disarray to focus the ship's weapons, releasing a volley of white orbs at the enemy vessel. Ordok now, the captain shouted. But before he could engage, the entire black shroud above Iclo exploded outward, and Valrin saw the fiery face of a woman in a massive form attempting to grasp them. Suddenly, a blast of white erupted from the deck of the Aela Sunrise, and when Valrin could see again, he felt weightless before the entire ship was suddenly submerged. There was a moment when he saw all his crew floating above the deck, but then the Aela Sunrise was brought up to the surface, and ominous orange skies loomed above them. What in the ice of the glacial seas was that now? Avern shouted. Damn Ilio! Valrin glanced around. He did not see a jungle island like before, but he did see a lone tower in the distance. I don't understand, Bray said. Why would the clockmaster intervene again? Ordak rubbed his chin. Could it be the Scourge Siren? It was almost upon us again when this happened. Valrin exhaled, directing the ship toward the island, though he had no idea what was to come. Debating why they had been taken from their time again would not answer any of their questions. I'm getting some wine, Bry said, going below deck. Evern let Rossi jump onto the deck and Ordak laughed. Your serpent is lazy. I barely see it half the time. Evern laughed. It cares little of most events as of late. Rossi has been hibernating, basically, shedding time. Do normal snakes hibernate when they shed? No. Evern smiled. But Rossi is above other serpents. Yes, yes, yes. Ordak shook his head. I know. Bry returned, shaking the bottle of wine. I hear it is better to not shake wine. Ordak said. The liquid is solid, but not ice. It is like it is frozen, but in time, not because it is cold. Evern shrugged. This place may not be of time itself. We do not know what this realm of orange skies and calm waters even is. Leave the wine for when we have saved Evium. As they approached the Lone Tower, Valrin noticed there was a small dock that, while made of stone and appearing stable at the base of the rocky tower, was still very small. The tower itself was covered in vines, and while it was not adorned, it was massive, at least two times higher than the castle in Taria. There were no windows or alcoves. The very top of the tower had a half-moon-shaped pinnacle with a slowing blue fire suspended in the center of the black spires that rose high into the sky. As Valrin reached the stone dock, the ship locked in, as typical of a Dwemhar dock. I'm getting quite tired of this, Bry said. Oh, Valrin said, I as well. But if I've learned anything of this clockmaster, it is that he had some form of plan. The door of the tower opened, and a man with a long gray beard wearing gold robes appeared. As I do, though I cannot say that it has been simple. Ordak drew his blade. Eliue, you continue to push us from one place to another. We must save our friend. Rossi slithered up onto the tip of Evorn's staff and hissed. A white serpent. Such a creature has a future of great works. I have seen a darkness defeated in part by such a serpent. Perhaps it will be you, Eliu said. Rossi hissed again and vanished into Evern's robes. Clockmaster, we have played your game, yet you fool us again. Fool or be the fool, that is to be decided, Eliu said. 
A storm was blowing in from the north. Dark clouds billowed up in the distance, and the air shifted around them, yet the temperature was impossible to gauge, because for a strange reason there was no feeling to the air. Come into the tower. I have prepared a meal for your arrival. Ascending several rocky steps, they entered the wooden doors of the tower ahead of Eliu, who promptly closed the doors behind them. Their eyes took a moment to adjust, and they stared upon a single room with a long table. Upon the table were all manners of meats and fruits, and seating for just the crew of the Ayla Sunrise. Eliu beckoned them forward. Eat, eat, I know you have not. Your time has not been as free as my own. Unlike most things, this food is real. Your next steps shall be treacherous. As they took their seats around the table, Ever noticed a small elevated tray near his seat with several dead mice. What is this? he asked. Farasi, of course, the clockmaster said. What kind of host has food they do not eat? Ordak asked. Eliu laughed softly. If I wished to poison you, I would not have brought you here. The ability to manipulate time comes with advantages. I could kill you while you were still in your mother's womb. Ordak slammed his hand on the table, but Evern grabbed him. Don't, the Shadow Elf said. Let us not provoke anything here. Valrin and Bry both filled their plates. Valrin half expected for the food to have no taste, but was surprised when it did. He took a sip of the drink in front of him and noticed it was a type of mine tea. Rossi jumped onto the table and began eating the mice on the platform. Slowly, each of the crew ate some food. Eliu simply stood and watched. What is going on? Valrin asked finally. We used the weapon the younger you made on Iclo. It worked, but the Scourge Siren would not let us get close. Eliu nodded. Steps toward a greater good. The one you call the Scourge Siren is not so simple a foe, but no matter, we must all deal with the decisions of the past. Your decisions to weaponize Aya Klo? Bry asked with a menacing stare. Did you kill Rangar? Eliu began to walk around them. I did not, nor did I kill Riakar. When you fled Aya Klo before I destroyed the Rusi city, I used my powers to halt time and move them all into a protected realm, and in time, move them back to their current time, but just different locations. Ayaklo fell shortly after that. The elves were still given their protected realms and were considered heroes by the gods for their actions in the face of pure evil as I was deemed. I admit I have tested them, the gods, and their patience. Etha still sides with me and knows I work to help you. Help me? Valrin asked. I feel you have done more to mislead me than help. Elihu paused. I have mastered time further than you understand. I age backward, as it is now. I suspect none understand time save those who have sailed its river back and forth. In doing so, there are versions of myself and even you, Valrin, that exist outside our own realm. The decisions we make or don't make are made in other versions of ourselves, and I have viewed such things. Had I not brought you here this time, you'd all be dead. The same as the first time. My actions through the many millennia lead all to destruction, but such is as it is. I say what is needed and nothing more. Your desire to save Avium is what drives you. My desire to destroy the evil in the world I have created is mine. There is evil in Iclo and around it. There is evil that is formed by my very actions alone. I secure my place as clockmaster to right the wrongs I have introduced. The Dwemar cut me off long before now. The Sea Peoples made their stand for their own beliefs in higher ascension, and the world was flooded. Nothing has changed, yet everything is different. Riddles! Ordak shouted. Give us something besides slivers of meat to whet our appetite! The darkness of Ayaklo was present in its creation. The Dwemhar who took control of it became the Scourge Siren. Ayaklo fed the original form and sustained the broken form. Your friend is set to be the new being of power in that place. Beyond that, nothing is important. 
I was cut off from the city of my own design, but I need something. This place is nothing but a point in time. I have provided you what you need in every way. When your meal is complete, you will find a box. Open the box and place the crystal on your vessel. With what you find in that place, you will then progress to Iaclo again. Do not engage what you see. Seek out old Iaclo hidden in the skeletons of old. A box? A crystal? Valrin asked. Eliu vanished without saying anything else. Where did he go? Bry asked. Valrin stood up, shaking his fist and forcing himself to exhale. This game, this game is getting old. Avern stood and took Rossi back into his robes. I am done. I care little for more drama here. The others stood as well, and suddenly the tower and all around them vanished, leaving only the rocky island, the open sea, and the Ayla sunrise. A single golden box appeared. Valrin knelt and flipped the latch on the box, revealing a small black crystal. As he picked it up, he felt nauseous and quickly set it back down. What is it? Evern asked. Just touching it made me sick. Evern hovered his staff over it and stared closely at the movement of smoke within it. It contains a memory, a place of old, I feel it. It is a place of the void. The void? Valrin asked. A place inhabited by Itsu. Why he would send us here, I do not understand. But seeing as this place around us is purely of his creation, we have no choice but to follow this path. Void? Ordak asked. The void that Riakar spoke of? The demons? Valrin closed the box and picked it up. He wouldn't send us there unless it was needed. I do not trust him, but at the same time I do not feel he wishes us harm. Evern laughed nervously. He may not, but sending us to such a place is not exactly the same as serving us an uncomfortable dinner. As they boarded the Ayla sunrise again, Valrin opened the box and set the crystal on the clockmaster's time device. Have you ever just wanted to sail the open seas, Valrin? Ordak asked. Or do you always have strange time-bending adventures? Evern cackled. He just sails about as much as I get left alone in the glacial seas and not taken on strange quests. As Valrin went to the helm, Bry stood with him. Do you think you'll need protection from demons, Captain? Seems likely, Valrin said. Valrin shifted the wheel to the right and took them away from the island. The crystal merged into the device, and soon they were pulled upward and away from the clockmaster's realm. There was a flash of white, and they found themselves in a dense swamp on the edge of a dark jungle. Evern, the Shadowlands has swamps. Do you think we are there? Ordak asked. Evern shook his head. No, this isn't the marshes. These ruins are Dwemhar. Valrin looked through the thick jungle cover and could barely see the dark ruins beneath the green vines. The place smelled foul, and not just from the gases of the swamp. Valrin felt sick just as before, and as he looked at Bry, he noticed she was sick as well. This place is evil, Evern said. The void was open here, but sealed. I cannot imagine why the clockmaster would send us here. Perhaps he cannot come here? Bry asked. An all-knowing master of time cannot go somewhere? Ordak teased. Just because he is a master of time does not make him a master of anything else, Evern stated. I have yet to see him do much beyond manipulating others. His wisdom is limited. That's where we come into it. Valrin said, drawing his sword. While the ship was sitting in water, there was nowhere for them to navigate to or from. A large tree trunk was directly up against the side of the ship, and the Stormborn was the first to disembark. Come on, we'll figure this out. From the trunk, the path continued over several fallen stones and through slick moss up to a large door with circular markings going around the entire rectangular opening. Valrin paused at the entrance, rubbing his fingers over the marks. Evern tapped his staff against the markings and then pointed up. The writing is ancient, something not at all of our world. 
but it appears Dwemhar, Bry said. The Dwemhar were inspired in their writings by divine beings. This place is what is left of an older race. This is a place Riakar came to at one time in the past. A holy place. But I feel no holiness here, Evan said as he stepped into the darkness of the doorway. Using his staff, he lit their path with a pale orange glow. There is a gateway up ahead in the darkness. As they followed just behind Evorn, Bry summoned her powers to shine further light on the small passage before them. Along the walls, she illuminated markings and drawings of floating mountains and a single circular object with many smaller markings around it. Ordok pointed over her shoulder, the mark for the god Kel and Barua, the Itsu god. Bry moved her finger on the markings. They appear as equal here, not at contest. Why? Evern looked back at them with the glow of his staff behind his face, illuminating his outline. At one time, the gods did not fight. They ruled as one. Ironic you see the one for war next to the one who was slain. It was Throka and Kel who defeated Barua, as I understand it. Is not Barua a god of the Shadowlands, Evern? Evorn turned away. The gods of the Shadowlands are any they choose for the time that they need them. They came to a large door with more writing and effigies of figures and stars. Runic writing stood out on a large flat stone in the center of the door. It reads, Evern began, to the common god, pathway to the old one, to the common fool, desolation, to the warrior who binds the void and guards the temple, reckoning. If these doors are sealed, it is for one to know that all who pass this way should be of stalwart heart. A gust of wind came from the doorway, and the door swung open just a bit before closing again. It isn't sealed at all, Valrin said. No, and so nothing of the old temple must remain. Evern pushed open the door with his staff and increased the illumination. Valrin looked up to see a canopy of trees and a dark sky. In front of them were several statues with broken faces surrounding a large pillar. As the crew made their way through, Valrin noticed another wall and a larger doorway. This one was broken down. There were statues at either side of this door that had been broken apart, and a large crack ran down the wall. Bry and Evern walked opposite of one another, both using their magic to shine light on where they were. Ordak walked behind Evorn and Valrin behind Bry. They approached the broken door and passed into yet another courtyard where there was a broken section of towers and a massive white bone. As they scanned up from the bone, they realized there were several others of varied length that led to another larger bone that was horribly severed. A hand, Ordak said. I am happy such a creature is destroyed. Evorn did not seem convinced, looking around them into the darkness of the jungle canopy. I don't think anyone is here, Bry said. Something is here, Valrin said. We were sent here for a reason. Evern went up a stairwell to their side, ascending onto the walls. Valrin followed him and looked out over a short expanse to where the tree line was. There was a river on the outer portion of the temple that was red as a rising sun. Strange water, Valrin said. I don't think it is water, Evern told him. He looked down to Ordak, set up a series of stones in a circular pattern, two small circles and one larger one, then pray that Etha can hear us. Right, Ordak said. The half-orc began gathering broken stones from the wall and doing just as Evorn said. Bry helped him. What is it? Valrin asked. The spirit of this temple. It is something I have only read of, but the water turned to blood tells me of its origin. It's Sue. No, something else. A lone soul, an impressionable spirit. As Evern went down to the lower area to assist Ordak, the wind blew the leaves of the trees erratically. These temples are protected by a benevolent spirit. The statues at the gateways channel that energy from the inner sanctum out to the first walls. From there, 
a gateway on the outer lines of the river opens to the realm of entry that one uses to come to such a place. This is not a plane of the living, but of the astral. In meditation, one could come to a place but not see it as what it is, but as a place of peace based on the definition of their own mind. If one would see their peace as the ocean, it would be an ocean or a garden, or time with loved ones. They would come to this place but only within the first walls. The sanctum was the resting place of the benevolent spirit. Then the bones are of the spirit? Ordak asked. No, the bones are from whatever Riakar faced while protecting this place. While he may have defeated the void, there was more to what happened. Perhaps without the protection of the statues and the energy running out to protect this sanctum, the spirit was changed. The winds were growing more turbulent. Evan began using his staff to cast a spell of earth magic onto the stones. Our presence alone is enough to call the spirit back. This has become a focal point of blood magic, a place of worship within the meditative realm of those who use such powers. Blood magic? Ordak asked. I know of this. You have spoken of it. How do you know of this temple if it is more a place of another plane? Valrin asked. I have studied magic for many years since I left the Shadowlands. I have picked up on many stories and pieces of lore, but how do I know this and of this place, the voice of the spirit? It tells me even now, it is coming, part seven, the benevolent one. The grounds of the temple rumbled, and then nothing. Get into the inner circle, Evern shouted. As they piled into the small spot, Evern sent more of his magic into the outer wall, and the stones floated upward. I built a ward. It works for vampires, so it should work for those who serve this temple's master, considering the alignment of magic in the moat of this place. The winds that were tossing the upper boughs of the jungle canopy paused without warning. The air was still. The only sound that any of them heard was the trickling of an unseen spring in the distance. Unless, of course, one counted Ordak's heavy breathing. You oaf, quiet, Evern said. I can't breathe. You can breathe, Evern told him. You're nervous. Stop. But Ordak began to gasp more, grabbing at his throat. Valrin noticed something gripping him with smoke. He gasped, reaching for Evern as he was dragged from the circle. Evern spun around, slamming the ground and sending a blast of orange fire out from around them. What gripped Ordak released, and the orc crawled back to the circle. Come out, Evern said. We seek not to harm you if you do not harm us. A small cat leaped onto a pillar not too far from them. Its eyes were glowing white. I do not harm, the cat said. I devour. The words were shocking but from such a small animal it was almost laughable. It's a cat, like from the ports in the glacial seas, Bry said. It appears as a cat, Evern warned. There is more to this. More to this, Shadow Elf? the cat asked. I feed on the blood of sacrifices. Have you come with one of those? I've never had orc blood before. Looks tasty. The cat began to grow in size, though did not change its positioning. Its face became grotesque, and its mouth gaped open, revealing fangs that dripped with green saliva. Close your mouth. You are not of this place. You are ill, sickened by what this place has become. This place was left undefended, the cat said. Do not blame me for its fall. I can only channel what is here, what is left. I was of goodness before. I gave strength to the hero who once fought here. We did well, but the doors were not sealed forever. Much evil has been channeled into the plane of meditation, much malevolence in your world. I had no hero to protect me as an exposed realm. I am a servant of you, Temple Guardian, Evern said. What has fouled your sacred spring? What has made you as this? The cat shrunk back to its normal size before floating off the pillar and hovering before Evern. One who came when the way was open, not of Itsu, not of gods. Something was hidden within the sanctum, but I cannot control what is channeled into me. 
I simply devour. The cat yawned. But I am tired of speaking. It takes much energy in this smaller form. It takes much time. I do not wish to waste more time. Time is all you have in your world. Time is the key. Where is the entrance to the sanctum? Valrin asked. It is forbidden for any to go there without the blessing of the gods, unless one has been allowed already, and none have been allowed, so I cannot open the way. But you said something was hidden in the sanctum, Bry said. Do you not wish us to remove what was hidden? Why would anyone seek to hide something in a place such as this? The cat seemed to be stumped by such a question. It turned its head and then licked its paw. You are Rusis, it said with a meow. It turned its head the other way and began to clean itself. And? Bry asked. The one who defended me once was not Rusis. He was a Dwemhar, allowed passage to all places. Dwemhar are allowed in. I am Stormborn, Valrin said, of the blood of Dwemhar. Then you are allowed in. The realization that he was the only one allowed in struck him, and he looked to the others. We seem to have figured out this riddle, Ordak said. Valrin sighed. I believe our master of time came here, Evern said. He left something. Do you think he came to defend this place with Ryakar? Bry asked. No, I think he took advantage of when Ryakar was allowed in and brought something of his own. It must be what we need. Then why send us? Bry asked. Because he is a coward, Valrin said. He didn't want to come back here and sent us instead. He uses everyone. That is what he is a master of, truly. Guardian, he said to the cat. I will go into the sanctum. The cat leaped back to its platform as several beasts appeared at its side. The beasts were of the jungle, covered in moss and vines, with glowing yellow wisps of magic hovering around their heads. That which guarded this place has taken a new form. The sanctum is a place of utmost power. You will see much, young Stormborn. Are you prepared? Valrin stepped out of the circle of protection Ivorn had created. Yes. The creatures immediately leaped upon him, grabbing and pulling him to the ground. Bry shouted, moving to step out of the circle, when Ordak grabbed her and Ivorn outstretched his staff. What is this betrayal? He shouted to the cat. The cat hissed. No betrayal. See? Valrin vanished beneath the stone in a wrapping of vines, and the beasts that had held him released their grip, falling back beside the cat. All was silent as the cat began to purr, rolling around atop the pillar. Now? Ordak asked, still holding Bry from jumping from the circle. We have to save him, she shouted. No, Evern said. This is a path the Stormborn must take on his own. Valrin felt strange. The sudden grasp of the creatures felt like nothing but cushions of air, not vines or jagged points as he'd expected when he was first jumped upon. As he felt himself released onto a cold stone floor, he opened his eyes to a brightly lit chamber. He stood up, reaching for his sword, which had been left near where he was dropped, and looked around. The room was bare, except a single corridor that led toward another brightly lit room. He crept forward, scanning the walls, the ceilings, and his footing. He did not expect this place to be so empty, but also this was not just a dungeon or a cave of bandits. Though, as he emerged on the other side of the corridor, he noticed an area with two mats, several pedestals, and bladed weapons. He walked over to the pedestals. Several of the weapons were much too large for him, having hilts as long as his arm. He noticed one was like the weapon the Dwemhar Nidra used, so that was an absolute not something he'd like. But then, he saw a saber much like his own, but of the same forged design of the others. He withdrew the blade with a clean ring, and he felt his own sword rattling in his opposite hand. The two blades pulled themselves forward and out of his grasp, flying into the center of a large circular room and spinning at a constant but slow pace. I am Valrin, he shouted out, stormborn and captain of the Aela Sunrise, realm ship of the Dwemhar. 
I know, a voice said. Ne he jerked around looking for the source of the voice, but did not see anyone. I am a voice of an old one, a worshipper here, meant to guide those who find their way here. You are not the guardian. Do I look as a four-legged cat? Valrin snickered and then quickly hid the fact with his hand. I do not need eyes to see you, for I see beyond that of flesh, tissue, and bone. You are the last chance of one of the original races. I am Stormborn. You are Valrin of Trava, a lone island, where a lonely boy was left to search for purpose. You were of the Dwemhar, who broke away before the Flood, the product of a war between a race. Your hand will come to purpose many times, but you have horror before you. Valrin noticed that a white ball of energy was floating high above him. As he stared at it, the ball floated down to near arm's reach. You see me but only in one form, a form I choose to take. The voice of this entity was soft, but had no tone to determine a gender or anything else. He realized it was like he was being spoken to as Avium could speak to him, yet he was hearing the words versus just a voice in his head. He could feel the vibrations of the voice. Once I watched two warriors defending this place, and as time would have it succeed, but time does not pass in this place. Time has no control, for there is no measurement of time here. Another came, one not welcome, who placed an object here many years ago in your understanding of time. You have come to retrieve it? Valrin shook his head. I do not know. In my world, a friend is captured, and we have been following the will of a Dwemhar who can move through time. We are to retrieve something, but I'm not sure of much other than that. Suddenly, a circular black stone with gold metal surrounding it and weaving through the material appeared floating between himself and the entity. A bloodstone, a source of magic, entwined with something that is of the Dwemhar. It has absorbed power not of your world for a purpose beyond the science and laws of time as they exist outside of this place. Valrin stared at the strange object. You give this to me without question? I need not question you, for I have read all of your mind. You waver between following and leading, yet you have had many instances of leadership. Embrace your title, Stormborn. Do not fear. Trials are before you, but I can give you a gift of your people. At this moment, his sword floated down to levitate next to the bloodstone. The weapons that remained here were used by the warriors who protected this place, Dwemhar objects, imbued with further power from their time here. If you wish, you must only imagine it as the blade you had before, and it will appear to others as that. But it is not the blade you wielded before. Valrin reached out, taking hold of this new weapon, feeling chills overwhelm him as he gripped the hilt. The silver guard going over his hand was now embedded with tiny crystals that were blue in color. The blade was silver, reminiscent of the metals used on Iaclo by the Veret gamblers. Is this a holy blade? It is beyond holy or unholy. It has been blessed by an old one, blessed by the powers of this place. No creature it strikes can resist its power, for its magic is drawn from beyond that of normal magic. But Valrin, such fate is not your own to face the great monsters of the world. No, it is but a tool to protect yourself and your crew, for the one who placed this stone manipulates your world, and not even I can tell for sure of his intent, save if he was here before me. Valrin reached out and took the bloodstone, bowing to the entity. Thank you. Such words are not needed, but with the removal of that object, this place will restore what you saw above. The Guardian shall return to its purer form. It is it that should be thanking you. Valrin felt himself floating upward and feeling tired. He yawned, closing his eyes, and when he opened them, he stared upon his crew and the Guardian cat. The monsters that were standing there before shook their limbs and became as robed cats no larger than the Guardian. The cat jumped down to Valrin. I feel a change within. 
My servants have taken my form again. The temple began to rumble again, but this time blue water began to flow into pools in and around the sanctum. The dark moss covering the stones dried and became as bright flowers. Valrin held out the bloodstone, to which Evern closed his eyes. That is something I do not wish to see. You can leave, the guardian said. Valrin blinked, and they were outside the temple. The overgrown jungle had become a simple green wood with a clear stream flowing around the Ayla sunrise, which now had a beautiful white stone bridge leading to the deck. As they boarded the ship, Evern looked at Valrin. That was within the temple. Yes, placed by Iliu, or so I understand it. Evern nodded. Those stones have a nefarious purpose beyond most magic. They hold the souls of sacrificed in order to draw their power. I believe there is more to it, Valrin said. I understand the powers of this plane are focused into it to make it something... different. Evern hovered his hand over the rock and then pointed to the Dwemhar medals. This is indeed something beyond a bloodstone. I dare not touch it, and I suggest that you not focus any thought on such a thing. Valrin put the stone in his pocket, and as he went to the helm, the ship began to move away from the bridge. He no more than touched the wheel, and they were back upon the ocean outside of Iaclo. It was like they had never left, except that now Iaclo was sitting in the water, damaged from their first attack. The ship near the edge of the island was darkened, and they were so far undetected by it or the scourge siren. What now? Bry asked. We go ashore, look for old Iclo, and proceed to figure out our next step. We have been pawns thus far. We have to trust what we do not know. Nice sword, Ordak said. Find yourself a new blade. Valrin had almost forgotten he had gotten it. Something like that. He focused, and the blade became as his old blade. Like the ship, Evern said. A gift I am fortunate to have. There was a shudder at their feet, and Bry noticed she was now wearing gauntlets. Evern's staff glowed brightly and then dimmed, and Ordak jumped. My blades are cleaner than they've been in some time, he said in excitement. Avorn examined his staff. What? Valrin asked. It seems the weaknesses of the wood from casting have been restored. It is as a new staff. Bry rubbed her gauntlets and smiled. Those remind me of the ones Rungar has, Ordak exclaimed. Avern took a closer look. Ruse's enchantments, not as Rungar, but of some level of power beyond your old. He looked to Valrin. Perhaps the guardian and temple put faith in us. A benevolent gesture. Valrin remembered the words of hardship he was warned of and sighed, looking to Ayaklo. Perhaps, he told them. Perhaps. Part 8. The Darkening. Iclo loomed ahead of the Ayla sunrise. Valrin kept their speed lower, the sails barely flapping in the wind, as those aboard the ship kept quiet and still. He went to the far edge of an inlet that was shared with the other massive enemy vessel. A beach extended between two large jagged pillars of stone, forming a harbor. In the distance, smoke rose from Ayaklo in random spots. The internal eruptions of the island were strange to him, considering he knew that beyond the rock of Ayaklo was an old city, but as the ancient technology crumbled into itself, and what magics kept the city aloft merged with natural energies and crystals, no one could really know what Ayaklo would do. But for now, it was like a festering beast, angry, unruly, with horrid tides and waves as they drew closer to the shore. Watch the waters. Beach the ship if you have to. It appears that water is reaching places in the rock it never did before. Ayaklo looked to be sinking, or at least sitting much lower than it was. Valrin kept the Shadow Elf's words in mind as he rounded the edge of the beach and angled them to catch one of the swells. Brace yourselves, he shouted. The waves knocked the Ayla sunrise up into already collapsed vegetation, planting them in the darkness and rolling the ship to the side. As strange as it seemed, 
They had done well, even though the ship broke through several limbs and tree trunks. It wasn't like it was the first time they had done something like this. Better than crashing into a city, Ordak said, brushing himself off. Evern and Brye looked around them as Valrin stepped off the ship and looked out across the bay. They had reached Iaclo undetected. Now? Bry asked. Valrin looked around, noticing the massive skeletal trees looming high above them, higher than the other trees of the island. These woods are new, but those trees are old, maybe a part of the old city. We go there. Perhaps we'll find what we seek. We were told to go to old Ieklo, and this seems like the best way. There was little debate, considering none of them knew for sure where to go. Valrin's idea seemed the best. The woods they were in were not vast at all, and soon they looked at a barren, rocky, and upturned region, likely broken by the fall of Iclo back to the sea and the already harsh environment of most of the island. Vents in the ground shot up hot gases, and at least twice Valrin or one of the others were nearly scorched by exploding gases. For a culture at one with nature and spirit, Ordak complained, this is not what I had in mind. I believe those are elves who are one with nature, Bry said. Dwemhar were one with spirit. Yes, this clockmaster seems one of spirit, Evern jeered. I'd like to cast a blast of magic at his spirit, or perhaps roast him. I wonder how the clockmaster would taste. Valrin pushed up a slight hill and looked back to Avorn. You haven't mentioned eating someone in some time. I was thinking you might not be into that anymore. No good sources, he said plainly. Could have snatched an elf back when we were dealing with the ranger and such, but I'd rather not. They were all depressed, and that doesn't make for good eating. Ordak sneered. You sure as I am an orc ate elves before. You and Lorlam. Evorn chuckled. Don't tell Avium of that, but he did taste it. I didn't tell him ahead of his snack what his snack was, but he figured it out. I should have led him with something other than it was fish. The jokes did much to take away from the bleakness of where they were. A few times, ascending higher before dropping lower, they gained sight of a Vium surrounded by a haze of red and black smoke above Ayaklo, but none spoke of it. There was no need to focus on what they did not have direct control of. Plus, Valrin could feel the stone in his pocket, and with every thought of it bumping up against him as he hurried deeper into the shadow of the massive dead trees, he could not help but feel a terror growing in his mind. That stone is not something we need with us, Evan suddenly said. I know, Bry said. I can feel it. It is evil. We must rid ourselves of it. He wondered if this stone was truly evil or if it was something else. In his own thoughts, he wondered if this was like the crystals that powered his ship, just a different source of power. It made sense to him considering he did not know of a need the clockmaster would have for it. They were on Iclo, but somehow their only thought was to rid themselves of this stone. They would do that and then head to Avium. As they passed through several more of the massive trees, they came to an area that was higher than the rest of the land. There was a large fire and movement in the center of this lower area, but they were too far away to see who or what was down there. Beyond this place were a shelf of cliffs and statues built out of the stone. Old or new, Ordak said, pointing toward the statues and places beyond the fire. Impossible to know, Evern said, but it doesn't look Dwemhar. I can imagine that if there was any inkling of the old Ayaklo, it might be beyond what we see on the surface. Then who built the statues and why? Bry asked. Delkians? Valrin asked. No, Ordak said. I don't believe they came this far. They also prefer the ritualistic view of erecting statues and then redoing them. They did it for their protector, you know. The half-orc motioned to himself and laughed. Ha! Ah, try it, Ivorn. Have you ever had a statue of yourself? Yes, he replied, to the annoying surprise of Ordak. We move closer, avoid these things in the woods, and move to the statues and the cliffs beyond. 
It makes sense that we may find something of use in a cave, considering the whole of the old city is underneath our feet. Evern led them, moving down into what appeared to be a newer stretch of woods that had been undisturbed by the shifting rock and fire of Ayaklo. So far. As they drew closer to the woods, they heard chanting, but it was not like the voices of elves or the slightly drunken songs of dwarves. It was something else entirely, something not at all peaceful. Evorn was crouched and running now along a line of thick bushes, with Valrin and the others just behind him. Valrin looked at the figures and realized that all of them were wearing masks like the ones in the Dwemhar Forge. Drums thundered over and over. The same beat continued. Smoke rose from some of the masked figures, and then he heard a scream. He paused, Ordok running into his back, and Bry igniting her spells. Evorn had been unfazed by the happening, but turned back and hurried to them. What are you doing? Come on! he demanded. The scream came again, and Valrin spotted a lone female being held against a stone by one of the masked figures. A moment later, one of them ran a silver blade through her neck, silencing her completely. As her body slumped down to the ground, they grabbed her by the hair, tilting her head back and allowing the blood to flow freely from the slash into several shallow bowls. Small dogs ran up, licking at the corpse, and what blood had not been collected as those with the masks went to others in attendance without masks. These figures were in dark robes and varied in size. While most were tall, at least two were shorter. As the bowl passed before them, they took sips of the fresh, sanguine drink before bowing and reaching for masks that were lying before them. Have you seen enough, Captain? Evern asked. Valrin had, and soon they were moving back through the woods, still out of sight of those who likely were not too attentive to what moved in the shadows as it was. As they went deeper into the dark areas of the woods, Evern looked back to Valrin several times. The clockmaster said ignore whatever we saw, and that's what I was doing. We should not be toying watching that form of exhibition. They ascended another hill after just passing a fast-moving river that thankfully was not too deep. They took a moment to rest. That was... Ordak began. Stop, Evern said to him. But you know... I will cut your tongue out if you speak of it further. Evern sighed and then looked to Valrin. What is it? Valrin asked. Evern shook his head. They perform something I had never thought to see this far north. Ordak is right. It is what he believes, but I do not understand it, nor do I wish us to deal with it. We move toward Evium, Bry said. Who cares what some tribal masks are doing in the woods? It is not who they are, but what they are doing. The act of sacrifice and drinking blood permeates beyond my old realm, but they perform a ritual of power meant to be performed only by those soon to die in honor of shadow magic. Is that not what the Veret gamblers used? she asked. It is but there is more to shadow magic than moving quickly or forming blades from seemingly nothing. These masked types are something I am not familiar with, and frankly, I'd rather see them throwing fireballs than commencing an act such as that. Evern paused. Captain, he said, looking at Valrin with the deepest of stares, it is of utmost importance we complete our tasks here and avoid any further run-ins with these masked individuals. I dare not face these without many more blades and casters. Ordak laughed. Well, old buddy, I can hold another axe, but it might not do too much. The wind blew over them, and Valrin looked to the caves they were nearly at. He could see that while there were no large torches or fires like in the woods, candles did line one way into the mountain in an area between two of the larger statues. Let's finish this he said. Valrin led them now, moving with haste directly into the open ground between the woods and the caves. The others were directly behind him, and as he reached the opening of the cave, he went to the left side and flattened himself against the stone. There were flowers leading into the entrance, and the wind whipped the flames of the candles. Evern and Bry went in first, moving into the darkness, 
making a point to not use too much of their spell to create light that could have possibly been seen by those on the outside. Come on, Bry shouted out. As Valrin moved in, he noticed that there wasn't much to the interior of the cave except for a large statue that was a few paces further in. It was here he found Evern staring up at the stone of a figure and using his staff to knock off a cruel mask of wood and leaves that had been erected over its face. A representation of the Scourge Siren, he said to them, masked by our friends in the woods, if I had to guess. Do you think that is what they want? Bry asked. To put a mask on the Scourge Siren? You mean Avium, Valrin stated. They want to use Avium. He drew his blade, jumping up onto the legs of the statue and slashing the stone with his sword. A blast of magic shattered the face, and it fell onto the ground of the cave. He stared down at those of his crew. Her mother will not take her, and neither will these masked types. We must find a way to old Iaclo and be done with this task. The crew went to searching, going through the random alcoves, feeling about for any clue that this cave was something more. Valrin stared at the statue. The stone atop the statue was different, like another layer had been placed. He forced his blade in between the layers and pried off a chunk, revealing an entirely different colored stone. Ordok, he said, motioning for the half-orc. We must remove this outer stone. I believe our path has been clear from the start. As Valrin and Ordak worked to smash off the thin layer of what made the Scourge Siren's image, a sheen stone began to emanate as Bry and Evern watched. What they revealed was none other than a representation of Etha herself. That is Dwemhar, Evern said. He moved his hand over a plaque still covered in chunks of stone. There is writing, unknown to most, but it is simple enough. And it says, Valrin asked, Passage 231, an outer door to our clockmaster's city of destruction. It seems our path is rather clear, Captain. But how do we open it? Ordak asked. There did not appear to be any lever or switch, no crystal they had missed before. Valrin pushed and prodded on the statue, but there was not a switch hidden in the stone. Bry stood before the statue, placing her hands together in front of her forehead before bowing slightly. Ether, may you grant us of the Aela Sunrise, crew under Valrin, the storm born, away into the old city. The statue began to glow bright and then cracked down the middle. A flash of white and the two pieces moved apart, revealing a narrow passage. What? We just had to ask? Ordak laughed. This was too simple. The passage ahead flashed white and then turned red in color. Valrin suddenly was dragged forward, sliding down the hallway almost uncontrollably. The others followed, but they could not hope to keep up. He was pulled from the hallway into a grand open expanse of sheer floors and high ceilings. A large column was in the center of the room, up at least two levels of stairs, and by the time Valrin figured out it was the bloodstone that was moving him toward the column, the stone had pulled itself through his clothing and flew into the column. The column flashed white and then red, sinking into the floor with a rumbling clamor, as in the far distance he saw his crew emerge in the chamber. Valrin pushed himself up, glancing around. This chamber was massive, larger than any of the caves or places he had been, with the only exception possible being the crystal caves from which he had gained control of the ancient fleet before their victory over the Barb King. The center of this room was a pyramid of sorts. Its massive square base had two levels with stairs that ran down to the floor. Valrin was on the second level, and the others sprinting to him had just begun up the first, when the pillar that was sinking into the ground with the bloodstone on it stopped moving, and all became silent. The stone! Valrin shouted to them as he went to join them. The stone! It pulled me here! Evern moved past Valrin and ran up the stairs, taking a closer look at the stone that was glowing like a burning star on the column. Void energy, he said, looking down to the others with a confused stare. He is using energy here. 
The Clockmaster is using energy, but he had us destroy Iclo. So, he does not wish to use Iclo, Valrin said. Then we have done it, Ordak said. We have done what he asked. But what have we done? Brye questioned. They stood together staring at one another when a blast of red lightning struck the floor between them and the door. Submit to the reckoning as is decreed, a voice thundered through the chambers of Iclo. The entire column erupted in a show of sparkling fire, sending Valrin and his crew running from the pyramid and around the electrified portion of the floor. The stones vanished in the portion of the floor covered in the mysterious energy, and a red smoke wished up and, in a tornadic fury, spread around the room. A single dark form emerged from the smoke, crowned in a circlet of black stone. As the form before them solidified, the entire room began to shake as if the entire island of Iaclo was about to collapse upon them. The creature stepped forward, sending a ripple of blood out from its massive clawed feet. The beast had the skin of a black dragon, but its face was made of bone. As it lumbered from the portal it had emerged from, it pointed out to the crew of the Aela Sunrise. Blood of the old, blood of the new, from the void I have come. Struck once and destroyed, I have been given second life. I shall take what was mine. It began up the stairwell, moving toward the bloodstone. Valrin noticed that the creature was missing its arm. Riakar, he said aloud. This was the beast he had fought, the bony hand we saw before. He wants the stone, Ordak shouted. We must not let him have it. The creature had ignored them other than its initial words. Ordak charged forward, but a bolt of energy came from the column, striking him and tossing him back. Evorn and Bry summoned wards, but the column did not lash out again. As the creature drew near the bloodstone, the column moved into the pyramid further, and the creature began to smash the stone over and over, attempting to dig downward. The creature smashed the pyramid in frustration, shouting as several obelisks burst forward, striking it with blue energy. The creature wailed in pain, swinging its one arm at one obelisk and then jumping upon the others. In a furious assault, it tore into the column itself, throwing stones asunder. The wards that Evern and Brye created shielded them as stone flew in all directions. The beast reached toward the portal behind it, calling forth energy from the portal itself, creating a massive spinning ball of energy that shrank the portal significantly. Blood dripped from this spell the creature had gathered, but in a leaping toss it smashed the remaining bit of the pyramid. The bloodstone flew into the air high above the creature before streaking straight down, creating a rumbling like no other. Ayaklo quaked. A beam of light shot up through the wrecked pyramid, striking the beast and throwing it back. Its entire form became limp, its magic destroyed or so it seemed. As the remaining energy from the portal collapsed, giving just a bit more energy to the creature, Several golden orbs rolled up and out of the services that had been created. A moment later, these same orbs formed into small metallic spiders with spinning crystals on their backs. Blasts of blue fire struck the monstrosity, and a melody began to sound, rumbling beneath them. Valrin recognized this. It was familiar. He had heard it at Iaclo before. In a few moments, a gold-domed metal object emerged from beneath the ground, pushing out the stones that sealed it in a supposed resting place. The bloodstone was bound to the crystal at its top, and as it spun around, it sapped the remaining energies from the room that had come with the beast. As waves of energy slammed the wards of Avorn and Bry, both casters braced themselves, shielding them from the blast that came next. The gold-domed object was in a can, a Dwemhar flying machine, and a moment after it emerged floating above the ruins of the pyramid, the smaller mechanical spiders jumped onto the Akan. The creature, beaten and bruised by the way it had been essentially cast aside and its power sapped away, reached upward at the Akan and growled. A few seconds passed, and the Akan shot up through the rock of the chamber ceiling and vanished from sight. I do not understand any of this, Bry shouted 
still holding the ward as more rocks fell around them. Light appeared above, but it was not the moon or stars or a spell. Lava poured in from the crack in the top of the ceiling. Valrin pointed his sword back to the door they had come through. This way, quickly, he shouted. He and the crew sprinted, running past the still-confused creature as it finally took notice of them and began their way. Miscreants, you all brought me here. I was carried by you to my own defeat again. The creature, though having no void magic anymore, stampeded across the room, throwing chunks of rock in every direction. Evorn turned, raising his staff with energy swarming around him before slamming his staff in the ground. Earth magic shot into the broken stones and surrounded the creature. It wailed and Valrin turned to look at Avern. Captain, go! We must go! Valrin sprinted, much different from being pulled by way of a bloodstone against his will. They fled to the outside world, emerging from the cave as more lava poured into the top and over the edges of the mountains as the ground rumbled. Valrin sheathed his sword, looking back as Avern slowly backed out of the cave, his staff still alight. As he emerged, the way was sealed once again. Now what? Bry asked. High above them, the clouds swirled above Iaclo, and violet magic floated into the air from the woods. As Ordok and Bry turned to look behind them, they saw a great host heading up into the mountains, even as fire leaped from places beyond sight, striking the stone. Valrin looked out, and many more ships had arrived on the coast than were there before. We must go to Avium, Bry said, pointing. Valrin saw his crew member. She was still floating in the twisting clouds above the island, and around her, the mother, the scourge siren, lashed out like the protective spirit it was, striking the host that went up the mountain. But there was one, a figure that stood out to him. This one floated just above the woods, and all that Valrin could see of this figure was a mask, a silver mask many times larger than the figure itself. But the more he stared, the more he saw that many bodies made up what he believed to be a single figure. Then, the sound of a scream, too familiar to Valrin, and all the crew of the Ayla Sunrise, tore across Iaclo. Somehow, the masked figures had reached up to the place where Aveum was. Avium was enveloped in the magic that flowed from the woods, seemingly coming from where the masked creatures in the forest had been. Valrin drew his sword with a clear ring. That mask uses power to strike her, Ordak shouted. Its source is ahead, but I do not know if we have the numbers, my captain, Evern said. I do not know if it's better for us to attempt to reach her now ourselves, or to go where you already plan to take us. Bry smiled. Let's try out these gauntlets doing something other than a ward. Valrin nodded. Follow me, crew of the Ayla Sunrise. Part 9. Escape. Valrin was well ahead of his crew. He saw that the silver mask was made up of multiple bodies, slowly losing more of its mass, but continually channeling energy from the trees beneath it into Evium's form. He had toiled to bring down Iaclo, traversed time itself, and somehow played the part of a puppet of the clockmaster, but none of that mattered now. Sword first, he pushed into the clearing where the large bonfire was, to the horror of multiple masked figures lying one on top of another on the felled timbers that had made up the fuel of the fire itself. The fire that burned now was shifting to a purple hue, and the smoke funneled around the mask above. The rest of the crew arrived in the clearing, and from the shadowy woods around them, figures emerged, holding spears spinning before them. Avorn and Bry sent spells of their own. Avorn released orbs of green, striking the ground before sending up entangling vines that bound many of the figures as Bry cast a stream of ice much larger than any spell she had done before. Her gauntlets shined a bright blue as her hair furled from the sheer power flowing from her body. Ordok and Valrin took up defense positions. More of the figures emerged, and now lizards the size of wolves jumped into the clearing. 
Valren slashed at the reptiles, taking two of them before Bry turned her casting to assist him. Ordok jumped onto one of the figures, slamming his axe into its head just as Ivorn slammed his staff into the ground, forming a wall of vines that shot out in all directions. The silver mask floated above them and lowered itself down into the fires, pulling more corpses into itself. It turned and looked at them as if sentient, and then floated away from the fire. Evern was the first to cast a spell at the mask, knocking off several of the bodies at once. The mask dropped nearly to the ground, and tentacles shot out from the mask itself, gripping more of the corpses. Valrin ran for it. Jumping with his saber, he slashed the tentacles, sending pieces flying that burned with a silver fire. The mask fell to the ground, vibrating wildly. Valrin ran to where it was and thrust his blade into the mask, shattering it. There was an explosion of white, and a sheer smoke rose out of the mask. Stormborn, you are known to me, Marog. I shall have you, and I shall have what I seek. You should not have come to this place so ill-prepared. The mask pieces flew up into the sky as energy blasted Valrin back. Drums sounded, though neither Valrin nor his crew could see any such instruments. Valrin looked up to a Aviam, and the Scourge Siren had completely wrapped itself around her form. The woods were blasted with winds from above, scattering the crew. Valrin flew into Bry, and the fire beneath the mask was extinguished. The mask fell from the sky as the hills shook, and the host that had gone into the mountains moved in a mass of erratic fury. Valrin grabbed Bry's arm and pulled her forward. He saw the flashes of Evern's staff in the distance, but he saw masked forms moving in between them. He had no idea where Ordak was, but he had to trust that the orc could take care of himself for now. He had to get to his ship with Bry. One way or the other, he would get to the rest of his crew, but with just a sword, he felt naked. His ship had the power to take out all these forms masked or unmasked. He could see it ahead. He sheathed his sword, and Bry and him made it onto the deck. The Rusis went to the rails and summoned lightning around her, chasing away the darkness as he switched the levers at the helm. The crystals spun to life, and the ship floated above the ground slightly. He focused his thoughts and moved the ship out of the trees, even as Bry's blasts tore up the earth and masked forms boarded the ship on all sides. She focused her energies, her eyes flashing white and gold as she forced the many figures back off the ship and shattered their masks. The Ayla sunrise floated over the cove as the waters beneath them were alight with an uncountable number of vessels. Bry was weakened, falling backward and collapsing. Valrin could see Evern and Ordak in the darkness below. They had made it to the shoreline but were surrounded. The Ayala Sunrise crashed into the water, sending up an arc of water that bent around the white ward Evern shielded him and Ordak with. Valrin engaged the Ayla Sunrise's weapons, sending a blast of fire from the ship's mass into the area around the ward. The masked forms fell back, and Evern and Ordak moved toward the ship. Valrin ran to the side, throwing a rope to them. Several figures came aboard the bow of his ship as other vessels closed in around him. He drew his sword, lunging for his foes, and was parried away by one of them. Ordak was there, having leaped to the upper deck. Both foes fell with streaking gashes across their necks. Valrin pushed himself up into the helm as Evern dropped down to Bry, forcing a potion into her mouth. The Rusis sat up as Valrin raised the sails. Ordak sat in the Dwemhar weapon, engaging the nearest vessels, sending them into the sky with balls of flaming wood, carving a path of escape. The massive vessel they had faced before was on the outer ring of ships, and its massive metal pieces were like bright beacons ahead. Valrin engaged every weapon at his disposal, looking behind him as multiple crystals darkened along the lower bow, meaning they would not have enough energy to keep up this type of barrage. Water flew up around them as black bolts, invisible in the darkness, struck the ship from all sides. Valrin glanced back to Aviam. Whatever Marog and his ilk were planning, he had stopped. 
The scourge siren, as ironic as it was, had protected her, and now he had managed to thwart what they planned. But they had to get away, regroup, and return. As it was now, getting away was the only problem. Ships moved in the darkness to intercept, and the bolt struck the center mass, sending wood flying across the deck. The engineers, the tiny orbs Elu had re-energized, went to work repairing the damage. Valrin broke right, running now parallel to the massive ship. There was an opening ahead, made wider by a blast from the Dwemhar weapon. How'd you like a bit more? Ordak shouted. Valrin looked back. They had three crystals remaining, and all the rest had darkened. No more, Valrin said. Tend to Bry. He noticed the Rusis was sitting up, but seemed disoriented now. Avorn was deflecting orbs flying from casters of some kind on the enemy ships, and all the while Valrin wondered where such a fleet had come from so quickly. The gap ahead was wide. Burning ships sank into the depths of the glacial seas. Valrin felt a sudden pain in his right arm. He nearly fell to one side, but managed to keep one hand on the wheel. He looked down to the lower deck and noticed Ordak was struck in the arm and Bry was holding a weak ward over him. Evorn grabbed him by the other arm as they passed the blockade of ships, and the Shadow Elf turned them for open ocean around the side of Iaclo. Valrin felt himself getting sick. His vision was off. He saw only blackness in the corners of his sight. Avern forced a potion into his mouth. This will inhibit the effects. Valrin could suddenly see much better, but Evern collapsed with a small arrow in his own arm. He looked back. The large ship had moved into the mass of broken ships and the burning path that Valrin and the crew had made. But now, several smaller ships were closing in. The enemy arrows had some type of poison, and though Bry was still conscious, she was still not standing. Valrin ensured he captured the best winds and attempted to outrun his pursuers. He looked back at the single crystal remaining. He would not be able to fight the enemy ships off if they got closer. He looked up. He needed starlight to restore the crystals, but the sky was darkened with smoke. There was a clang to his right, a grappling hook. He ran to the hook, looking down at the vessel that was now nearly level with his own. He slashed the line and went back to the wheel, spinning it to the right and sending his ship into a collision with the other one. Timbers split, and the other ship was enveloped in water. He wheeled the other way just to be rammed himself by two more vessels. More grappling hooks struck on the lower deck. He braced the wheel with Evern's staff, holding it in a direction toward the way he was being rammed. Rossi slithered out from Evern and hissed, following Valrin to the lower levels. Valrin cut the lines, crossing swords with two figures with masks. He parried one as Rossi shot up and over his shoulder, biting the other in the face through the mask. Valrin cut the remaining lines and pulled Bry toward the opposite side of the deck. Something struck his back, and he turned to see a hook latching on now to this side as another vessel came. The Ayla sunrise was stopped. Valrin and Rossi were surrounded. He staggered as he fought the pain in his back when he felt a prick in his neck. It wasn't an arrow, but as he removed the jagged dart, he realized that no one was going to be able to give him a potion, and it didn't matter. Many masked foes surrounded them. He fell unconscious aboard the deck of his ship. Part 10. Asunder. You! Wake up! Valrin heard a voice he had never heard before. His entire body ached. He could smell flowers, and it was very warm. He opened his eyes and could only see a single light ahead, but then a silhouette appeared. Bry, he said. His eyes focused on a bright moon, about the only light he could see, as this figure hovered over him. No, don't know them. Maybe it is one of the others. You came from the sea? The one with the ship? They have it. You're not getting to it. But it is just your luck, because I am here. Valrin sat up. His neck was still sore from the dart, but he was doing well considering. He looked around. There were bars on a wooden door ahead of him. 
He felt a tap on his hand and looked down to see Rossi. If you're here, where are the others? Rossi slithered over to the corner of the small chamber they were in. It was some type of a cave, but with bars over every opening. Prison? He asked the figure. It was a female, and from the looks of her stance, she was waiting on him. Yes, so it seems, I guess. The thing is, it's been three days since you and the other three with you got here. They are being kept away from here, but lucky for you, this snake has been most helpful. Valrin stood up, a bit wobbly, but his cellmate steadied him. So what is your name? Valrin he said, going to the door and looking out. He could see dark mountains beneath the bright moon. There was a cove and many ships beneath them. Looking for his own ship, he did not see it, but instead saw many other vessels like the ones he had fought near Ayaklo. Valrin, I know you may not believe this, but you are most fortunate. I am? he asked. My ship is missing, and I am captured in a place separated from my crew. Unless you have a key and a way for me to help my friends and reclaim my ship, I'm not sure I would agree. Well, as I said, the snake, Rasi, you said its name was, has been most helpful. She held up a key. My name is Elear. I hail from the far south of the Shadowlands. I have a way out and a way to save your friends, but I'm going to need your help. Valrin didn't have any idea who this Elear was, but he didn't have much of a choice now. Fine, if you'll help me, I guess it is fair. You have a key to get out of here, it seems, so what do you need help with? They took my dragon, and you're going to help me get her back, and we're going to burn this entire island, no matter if that bastard Marog is the ruler here or not. This is the end of Epochs. Shards of Ether is the next explosive title in this series. How do you like dragons? As the inner workings of the Clockmaster become painfully evident, Valrin and the crew of the Aela Sunrise face more difficult challenges, meet new friends, and prepare for the final climactic showdown on Ayaklo to save their lost friend. Pre-order this title here. HTTPS colon slash slash www.amazon.com slash gp slash product slash b07p5cxdm2 slash. If the link above does not work, simply search Shards of Ether JT Williams on Amazon and it should show up.